The first witness in the case study, Commissioner, is Mr Werat from ANZ. Yes. Ms. Ms. Williams or Dr Collins? Uh, Ms Williams? Yes. May I please the Commission? Uh, yes. Mr Werat uh, is in the hearing room, if you might uh, come forward to the witness box. Mr Werat, if you'd come into the witness box, uh, would you prefer to take an oath or would you wish to make an affirmation? Uh, affirmation. Affirm the witness then, please. I solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give that the evidence I shall give will be the truth will be the truth the whole truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth and nothing but the truth do sit down mr Werat. yes Ms. Williams. thank you commissioner uh, would you please state your full name Darren John Werrett and are you the head of Aligned Licensees and Advice Standards at ANZ Banking Group Limited? Yes, I am. And the head office of ANZ Banking Group Limited's business address is 833 Collins Street, Docklands in Victoria, is that correct? That's correct. And uh, have you made a uh, witness statement uh, together with exhibits in response to some questions asked of you by the Commission? Yes, I have. Right. Uh, and I believe uh, I, you have uh, part of your witness statement exhibits there, but you're missing some volumes. Might I ask that those be provided to Mr Werrett through the assistant? Yes. Thank you. Mr Werrett, have you received a summons to appear to give evidence before the Commission and to produce your signed statement? Yes, I have. Uh, do you have the summons with you? I do. I tender the summons, Commissioner. The summons to Mr Werrett will be Exhibit 2.128. Uh, Mr Werrett, I understand there are some corrections you wish to make to your statement, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, is the first correction to paragraph 4.36 at page 17 of your statement? Yes, it is. Uh, and is the correction, the addition after the word terminated on the second line of paragraph 4.36, the addition of the words with effect from 30 June 2016? That's right. Thank you. Perhaps if you'd make the amendment uh, in handwriting and initial it for us, that would be kind. Yes. Uh, could you turn to page 30 of your statement, please, Mr Werrett, and paragraph 5.48? Is there a correction to be made in the sixth line of paragraph 5.48 by the deletion of the words in parentheses to save fees equal to 1.4 per cent of the balance? That's right. And is there a further correction that you wish to make inserting in that place the words with more expensive fees? Yes. If you wouldn't mind making that correction, please, if that's appropriate for the Commissioner. And finally, Mr Werrett, would you turn to paragraph 5.126 of your statement on page 42? Uh, was paragraph 5.126 of your statement correct when your statement was signed on the 5th of April 2018? Yes, it was. Has there been a subsequent development in relation to the matters you refer to in that paragraph? Uh, yes, there is. And what is that development? Uh, I've asked for a case to be uh, escalated and reviewed for remediation. Thank you very much. And uh, subject to those matters, Mr Werrett, are the contents of your statement true and correct? Yes, they are. Uh, Commissioner, the statement is uh, produced in response to the summons and I tender the statement and the exhibits. The witness statement of Mr Werrett and exhibits is 
Exhibit 2.129. Please, the Commission. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Orr. Mr. Werrett, uh, you've been put forward by ANZ to give evidence about advice provided by two financial advisors, Mr. John Doyle and Mr. Christopher Harris. That's true. Uh, they've both provided advice on behalf of financial planning businesses owned by ANZ. That's correct. And ANZ operates its financial advice business through four entities, is that correct? Yes, it does. And they are ANZ Financial Planning, uh, which operates under ANZ's Financial Services Licence. That's correct. RI Advice Group Proprietary Limited, which is owned by ANZ but has its own Financial Services Licence. Yes. Millennium 3 Financial Services Proprietary Limited, which is also owned by ANZ but has its own Financial Services Licence. That's right and Financial Services Partners Proprietary Limited, another entity owned by ANZ but with its own licence. Yes. And you refer in your statement to RI Advice Group, Millennium 3 and Financial Services Partners as ANZ's aligned dealer groups. That's right. And how are they different from ANZ Financial Planning? The difference is that the aligned dealer groups are self-employed business people, so there's no employment relationship with the advice given there. With who, sorry? With their advice. They, they own the businesses, so they're self-employed. Yes, thank you. And you joined ANZ in February 2013 as the CEO of RI Advice Group. That's right. Uh, and since April 2016, you've been the general manager of aligned licensees and advice standards at ANZ. Yes. Okay, and in that role, you're responsible for supervising and monitoring the activities of the three aligned dealer groups? That's right. Mm -hmm. And you also supervise the advice review team, which is responsible for determining whether clients have suffered financial detriment as a result of misconduct by an advisor from one of those three aligned dealer groups? Yes. Uh, and also from ANZ Financial Planning? That's right. And that team decides on the amount of compensation that should be paid to those clients? They follow a process that's been defined to calculate any detriment. Yes, thank you. The first advisor that you deal with in your statement is Mr John Doyle? That's right. Yes, and Mr Doyle became an authorised representative of RI Advice Group on the 8th of May 2013? Yes. Uh, could I ask you to look at ANZ 800 4470172? This is a document described as a principal authorised representative agreement. Sorry, what tab is that? Oh, I'm yeah. sorry, it's not in your statement. Okay. It uh, should be on the screen for you there. Oh, my mistake. Uh, yes. You have that, Mr Warrett? Yes. Uh, so you see there that it's a principal authorised representative agreement. Yes. And if we turn to 0178. We'll see that the parties to the agreement are RI Advice Group and the representative and that it's executed on the 8th of May 2013. And at 0220, we'll see who the representative is. So the representative is the Carrington Corporation. That's a corporate entity associated with Mr Doyle. That's correct. And the principal person we see there is Mr Doyle. Yes. And could I ask you to look at 0195 and clause 10 of this agreement? Clause 10 deals with remuneration. Perhaps if we could have, yes, the entirety of that clause blown up. Uh, clause 10.1 tells us that the advisor has to ensure that all fees and commissions are paid directly to RI Advice Group. Yes. 
and 10.2 tells us that the representative is entitled to the remuneration set out in item 4 of Schedule 1. We'll turn to that, which is 0221. And we see there at the top that the representative is entitled to receive Uh, we, we have a redaction that I had not understood had been made here uh, in the first line there. The um, non-publication order permitted the redactions in the table. Um, there is a reference there to a percentage of fees and commissions, but until we check whether that was a permissible uh, redaction, I'll leave that for now, uh, Mr Warrett. Do you have a copy of this document in unredacted form? I'm unsure. We'll pass a copy to you, Mr you. Werrett. What I want to put to you relates to the redactions in the table. We'll see there that there's a practice fee and an authorised representative fee that are payable by the representative to RI Advice Group. Those figures have been redacted, but what I want to ask you, with the unredacted version, is if you agree with me that the amount of the practice fee that the representative has to pay decreases the greater the revenue that the representative brings in. We're at 0221 in the document, Mr Werrett, looking at the right, table. Thank you. Yes, the practice fee decreases uh, as the total revenue of the business increases. Thank you. And the amount of the authorised representative fee that the representative has to pay to RI Advice Group also decreases the greater the revenue the representative brings in. So it's the greater the revenue of the business, yes. Yes. So uh, there is an incentive uh, to earn revenue because there is a portion that I won't mention of the fees and commissions that is payable directly to the representative and the greater the revenue brought in also the lower the practice fee and the authorised representative fee that the representative has to pay to RI Advice Group. Yes. Thank you. Um, I'll tend to that document, Commissioner. Uh, RI Advice Group, uh, Principal uh, authorised representative agreement 8 May 18 with, was it Carrington? Carrington uh, Corporation Propriety Limited. Corporation Propriety Limited, ANZ 800 477 is exhibit 2.130. Mr Werrett, have you heard of a financial advice entity called Australian Financial Services Limited? Yes, I have. Are you aware of action that ASIC took in 2011 against that entity? Uh, yes. Are you aware that following a six-month surveillance of that entity, ASIC identified a range of concerns with its practices which led it to impose additional licence conditions on the entity? So the extent of my knowledge of the circumstances is what's been limited to publicly available information? Yes, so let's go to that publicly available information at RCD 0021 0001 This is a media release um, from ASIC about the action it took against Australian Financial Services Limited, dated the 7th of November 2011. Do you see there the reference to ASIC imposing conditions on the licence of Australian Financial Services Limited? First sentence. Yes. Following a six month surveillance. Yes. And do you see the reference to the concerns identified by ASIC during that surveillance, which are listed 
about halfway down the page, the surveillance identified concerns in relation to the management of conflicts of interest relating to advice provided to clients to switch their investments to financial products associated with and or related to the licensee, concerns with meeting the requirements of a compliant dispute resolution system, concerns with the monitoring and supervision of staff and representatives, concerns with compliance with the requirements of section 945 capital A of the Corporations Act, the requirement to have a reasonable basis for advice provided to clients, and concerns with compliance with section 947 capital D of the Act, the requirements when advice recommends replacement of one financial product with another. Yes. You're aware of these concerns and the results of these concerns in 2011, which was the imposition of ASIC's imposition of additional licence conditions by ASIC on this entity? Yes, from the information on the screen, yes. Thank you. And were you aware of this information at the time, in 2011? It was generally available out into the market, so... Uh, and were you aware of it, Mr Warrett? I was aware of what was going on with AFS. Yes. Um, so the specifics that are referenced there, uh, I don't recall, but certainly what had happened to the AFSL that was AFS, yes, I was aware. Thank you, I tender this document, Commissioner. Uh, ASIC Media release concerning Australian Financial Services Limited 11-243MR RCD 0021 0001 is Exhibit 2.131. Could I ask that you look at ANZ 800 512 0002, Mr Warrett? This is an ANZ document, Mr Warrett, dated the 22nd of March 2013, entitled AFS Retention Strategy. Have you seen this document before, Mr Warrett? I have. Uh, is AFS there a reference to Australian Financial Services, the entity to which I have just referred? Yes. Thank you. Could I ask you to look at 0003 in this document? We see there an executive summary headed background and problem to solve. Uh, remembering that this document is dated the 22nd of March 2013. We see that the document records that OASIS and AFSS commenced the strategy badged product suite on the 1st of July 2000. OASIS was the product issuer and administrator, while Strategy Portfolio Limited was the distributor. The product is used by advisors licensed through AFS as well as advisors from several other dealers and licensees. At 11 March 2013, the total, is that funds under management? Yes, it is. The total funds under management in strategy products was $1.04 billion. This can be categorised between funds under advice? Yes. Controlled by AFS advisors being 677 million or 65 per cent, with the other 364 million controlled by other dealers or licensees, 35 per cent. AFS has attempted several sale processes over the last few years, most recently coming to financial terms at a dealer level with BT. We understand that AFS has substantial financial liabilities, both institutionally and to its own advisors. We are recently aware that the BT commercial arrangement has experienced issues through the due, due diligence process. In light of this, several institutions are aggressively approaching AFS advisors directly with financial offers. A&D have confirmed that the majority of AFS funds under advice is now at significant risk of migration to competitive platforms as AFS advisors are recruited into institutional licences. Licensees. This paper considers how we might best retain our current strategy funds under advice through a proposed recruitment of quality or high value AFS planners into our aligned advice networks. A&D have currently identified advisor practices representing $386 million of ASS funds under advice 
that they would like to take a commercial proposal to. A&D advise this funds under management is at significant risk to competitors in the market. Now, Oasis, referred to here as the product issuer and administrator, Oasis is associated with ANZ. Yes, it is. It's a product issuer owned by ANZ. Yes, it is. So we see here that having identified this problem, ANZ identified two approaches to solving this problem. The first is reflected on the following page, 0004. Scenario one was to offer former AFS advisors a financial incentive to move to ANZ's aligned dealer group. Yes. And we see in the right hand column in the middle that uh, this would have an upfront cost of 1.2 million in FY13, but there would be a net present value to ANZ of 1.6 million. That's correct. And if we turn to the second potential solution identified by ANZ at 0005, the other option was to offer no financial incentive to AFS advisors. And we see again in the right hand column in the middle of the page that this would lead to the funds under management moving off the platform and a loss of revenue of $6.2 million over four years. That's what the paper covers. I'm sorry? That's what the paper covers. Yes. On. And at 0006, we see the recommendation which is that an offer be made to selected AFS advisors on the terms set out on this page. They needed to sign up to one of the aligned dealer groups for a minimum term of three years. Uh, we see the upfront payment there, which would be capped at $150,000 paid to advisor practices. And all new business had to be written to ANZ product offerings, Voyage, in line with standard aligned dealer terms. It was conditional upon advisors using best endeavours to move existing strategy funds under advice to Voyage and or Aspire, and all transition fees were to be waived for advisors moving their funds under management from strategy to Voyage or Aspire. And, and do you see there, uh, Mr Wherett, that there was an acknowledgement on this page that this was a strategy to be undertaking, undertaken with things happening prior to advisor execution, uh, sorry, to advisor acquisition. The first was to execute appropriate advisor due diligence prior to advisor practice acquisition to ensure ANZ Wealth is appropriately protected from any onboarding risks. Yes, I do. Now, one of the targeted advisors from AFS, AFS was Mr Doyle. Mr Doyle. Yes, yes, and if we go to 0007. We see the reference to Mr Doyle uh, five or six lines down and his practice, Carrington Financial Service. And we see there that Mr Doyle had $60 million worth of funds under management in the strategy that's product, yeah. uh, which made him equal for the highest funds of the advisors on this page uh, with funds under management in that platform. You'll see there's another advisor down the bottom of the page who also had $60 million funds under management on the platform. That's correct. So RI Advice Group decided to actively seek out advisors from Australian Financial Services. The AFSL of the Australian Financial Services was being closed down. Yes. And there was competitive pressure in the market uh, at the time for us to acquire via our licence some of those businesses. Yes. And uh, that diagram there shows uh, businesses that were interested in potentially what we could bring. 
So do you agree with my proposition, Mr Whereat, that RI Advice Group decided to actively seek out advisers from Australian Financial Services? Yes, I do. And they did this despite the fact that ASIC had imposed additional conditions on the Australian Financial Services licence as a result of advisor misconduct? Uh, yes, we were aware of that. And it did this because it wanted to bring in the $677 million of funds under management in the strategy product. The money in the strategy product uh, was already with the organisation uh, in, uh, in the OASIS administration system. Mm -hmm. you, you wanted to retain it there though, didn't you? Absolutely. You wanted it not to go to others in the market. It was, it was part of the, the strategy for um, the market at that time, yes. And you needed to do this, bearing in mind that this document is... Uh, March, 32 March, Ma March, March 2013, because the 1 July 2013 FOFA deadline was approaching. Yes, it was before. And the ban July. on conflicted remuneration was approaching. Uh, yes, it did start then. And after that date, if these things weren't on your books, you'd be prevented from receiving commissions in relation to these products? Yep, FOFA has banned those payments. Thank you. I tender this document, Commissioner. 2.132 is Memorandum AFS Retention Strategy 22 March 2013, uh, ANZ 800. Uh, 512 0002, Exhibit 2.132. And in April 2013, uh, after this March 2013 document, ASIC contacted ANZ about its recruitment of Australian Financial Services ex-advisors. Uh, ASIC did make contact, yes. Yes, and could I ask you to look at ANZ 800 038 2780? These are the papers of a meeting of the Advice and Distribution Risk and Compliance Board Committee uh, on the 29th of May 2013. That's correct. You, we can see from this first page, Mr Whereat, that you were present at this meeting. Yes. Are you familiar with this document? In the course of preparing the statement, yes. And could I ask you to look at 2801? We see there a reference under the heading onboarding of AFS advisors that on the 5th of April Money Management had released a press article discussing RI advice and its recruitment of ex-AFS advisors. ASIC subsequently contacted ANZ Global Wealth Risk and Compliance seeking to meet to discuss concerns regarding the compliance framework of AFS. On 16th of April a teleconference was held, which you participated in with ASIC representatives, and ASIC was keen to ensure that in relation to professional indemnity insurance, all parties understand the obligation of the new licensee and the advisor in respect of past advice. Um, do we see that management emphasised ANZ's interest in protecting its reputation and those of its clients by appropriately managing the risks, and ANZ, or I should say RI, RI Advice Group confirmed that it would only onboard those advisers who met our enhanced due diligence standards. You recall this conversation, Mr Werrett? I, I don't recall the specifics of the conversation given the amount of time, but certainly um, the flavour of the minutes does reflect um, what the conversation with ASIC was about. And do you recall that assurance being given by RI Advice Group to ASIC that it would only onboard AFS advisers who met your enhanced due diligence standards? Yes. Uh, tender that document, Commissioner. Uh, uh, Advice and Distribution Risk and Compliance Board Committee Papers, 29 May 2013, ANZ 800 038 2780, Exhibit 2.133. Now, the day before that teleconference, on the 16th of April, uh, 
a recruiting summary document for AFS was circulated within ANZ. Can I ask you to look at ANZ 800 That's an email attaching some documents on the 15th of April. And can I now take you to one of those attachments, which is ANZ, I'm sorry, it follows. It's 800-508-0104. So this is a recruiting strategy document for ex-AFS advisors at RI Advice. And if we turn to 0105, we see a reference in the middle of the page there to the approximately $6 billion in funds under advice with AFS. And we see also there awareness by RI Advice Group of the licensing condition that was added in 2011 requiring additional focus on supervision due to use of own products. Yes. And if we turn to the following page, 0106, we see that the plan at our advice group was to utilise the instability within AFS to target only their higher calibre businesses. Yes. And at 0107, we see a reference to uh, ANZ making non-binding offers to AFS practices subject to due diligence. And you see there the reference to, in the fourth dot point down, it remains subject to an extensive due diligence review by RI before proceeding. Yes. And at 0109, we see that uh, Carrington Financial Services, one of that's Mr Doyle's company, on the fifth line down, is listed as one of the target practices. You see that? Yes. And this document tells us that at this time, that practice had accepted a non-binding offer. Third, third column. And at 0110, we see that RI Advice Group is to strictly adhere to its onboard, onboarding process. Do you see this at the third dot point? Including reviewing the last compliance and audit reviews and vetting every statement of advice for an initial period. So these were the onboarding processes that RI Advice Group put in place for its recruitment of AFS advisors. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Uh, and at 0115, can I just direct your attention to the advisor appointment process and the fact that it included uh, on the top row there in the middle, the administration of a competency and knowledge test before the agreements were issued. You see the agreements issued is over at the far right column. Yes. I tender that document, Commissioner. Uh, with the email or without? With the email, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, email younger to Williams, uh, 15 April, uh, 13 ANZ 800 and attachment uh, ANZ 800 together will be exhibit 2.134. Could I ask that you now be shown uh, ANZ.800 
this is um, an application form that Mr Doyle submitted to be appointed as an authorised representative of RI Advice Group. Uh, I'll show you um, the page that makes clear it's about Mr Doyle. It's 1814. Sorry, on 1814 you'll see the signature and the date. And if we could also have uh, 1807 uh, brought up, you'll see there the reference to Mr Doyle. Uh, at 1807, we see that Mr Doyle has described himself as having a Diploma of Financial Planning. Do you see that? Do you see that box ticked at the top right hand? Yes. And if we move below that, we see that Mr Doyle has identified himself as being a member of a number of professional associations, including the FPA and the AFA. Yes, that's correct. And he provides information about the areas of advice that he gives on the bottom of the page. It appears that he provides advice on a very wide range of topics. Yes, I can see that. Uh, attend to that document, Commissioner. Authorised well, representative application form by Doyle, 13 April uh, 13, ANZ 800. Uh, 5111804 is exhibit 2.135. I've taken you to the principal authorised representative agreement that Mr Doyle, through his corporate entity, entered into with RI Advice Group in May 2013. There was another agreement entered into which was called a commitment deed. Uh, can I show you that document, which is ANZ 800-447-0150? Can I ask you to look at uh, Schedule 1 of that document, which is at uh, 0154, containing the commercial terms? And the amount has been redacted, uh, but we see there that under this commitment deed, within 30 days of the date of appointment, RI advice paid to Mr Doyle's practice an upfront payment. That's correct. And we see from clause seven here that RI Advice Group and Carrington also agreed that RI Advice Group would pay Carrington a transition payment for any external funds under advice belonging to existing clients transition to certain platforms, being the One Answer Frontier platform and the Oasis Voyage platform. Correct. Transition payments like this were likely to influence Carrington and Mr Doyle to convince clients to change over to those platforms, weren't they? After meeting all their professional obligations, yes, I do believe well, these this payments is, would influence that. This is therefore <coughs> conflicted remuneration, is it not, Mr Werrett? Uh, post FOFA, yes, it would be. Yes, so if this agreement had been entered into two months later, in July 2013, it would have been unlawful. That's correct. Thank you. Um, I mentioned earlier that, I'm sorry, I'll tender that document, Commissioner. Commitment deed, 6 May uh, 2013, ANZ 800 447 0150 is exhibit 2.136. I mentioned earlier that the recruit recruiting strategy that we looked at said that RI Advice Group would review Mr Doyle's last compliance audit. Do you recall that document? I do. And did that occur before RI Advice Group appointed Mr Doyle as an authorised representative? So it's my understanding that Stephen Blood, which is the head of compliance, reviewed five files of Mr Doyle. When do you say he did that, Mr Whereat? Uh, before Mr Doyle was brought on to RI. And do you have any documents about that? Uh, I believe I have cited documents in my investigations to prepare this statement. All right. 
the recruitment strategy also mentioned that Mr Doyle would be subject to a competence or knowledge test. Do you recall that? Uh, I, I recall you putting it up. I don't recall it at the time. Do you know if that occurred before RI Advice Group appointed Mr Doyle as an authorised representative? Uh, I'm, I'm unsure, but I have um, since found um, yesterday that Mr Doyle um, had attempted to complete that competency assessment. Well, let's look at his exam results under that competency assessment, uh, Mr Werrett, at ANZ 800 511 1849. We may need to blow this up so that we can read it. But these are the results of Mr Doyle's compliance exam, aren't they, Mr Werrett? They are. Uh, so this was conducted on the 15th of July 2013? That's correct. And that's after Mr Doyle became an authorised representative of RI Advice Group in May 2013? Yes, it is. Why didn't RI Advice Group require him to complete the exam before it appointed him, as the documents we've looked at indicated they were going to do? I don't have an answer. I'm unsure. And we see here that the pass mark, the basic pass mark up in the top line for this test was four out of six. See that in blue up Thank the top? You. And in four of the seven categories, Mr Doyle was assessed as being not competent. Yes, I can see that. And the overall score, do you see above the table, was not yet competent? Yes. And did RI Advice Group take any steps to ensure that Mr Doyle passed a competence test before he provided advice to RI Advice Group customers? I'm unsure. Did RI Advice Group apply any enhanced monitoring or supervision to Mr Doyle as a result of these exam results? As a direct result of these exam results, again, I'm, I'm unsure. Mm -hmm. Have you seen anything to suggest <coughs> that RI, <coughs> excuse me, that RI Advice Group did do anything uh, to apply enhanced monitoring or supervision to Mr Doyle as a result of these tests? No. Thank you. I haven't tendered that document, I don't think, Commissioner. I tender the exam results. Um, Doyle exam results for financial planning knowledge, uh, 15 July 2013, ANZ 800 511 1849, exhibit 2.137. A bit over 18 months after these exam results in February 2015, RI Advice Group, we can see from the documents, conducted an audit of five of Mr Doyle's client files. That's correct. Now, is, is it possible that that is the review of five files by Mr Stephen Blood that you were referring to earlier? Uh, no. Uh, you maintain that there was an earlier review of five additional files? Before Mr Doyle was mm -hmm. brought on, yes. And Audits are the main way that RI Advice Group monitors the quality of its advice? Uh, yes, it's, it's one of the ways we do that, yes. Well, they're uh, the main way that yes. RI Advice Group does that, aren't they? Yes. And why was this particular audit in February 2015 conducted on Mr Doyle? Uh, it was conducted on Mr Doyle uh, because he had cleared um, um, vetting and that was his first review whilst being part of the RI group. Well, how frequently are RI advice group advisors supposed to be audited? Uh, the audit cycle is every 12 months. Yes. Um, but we see that the first audit that Mr Doyle was subjected to was in February 2015 and he had commenced as an authorised representative in May 2013. Uh, that's correct. What, what you've un, um, what, what's been shown as I was going through and preparing this is there was uh, the control in place to do a review three months after they've cleared vetting uh, was an issue because it allowed people to go 
past that 12 month cycle. So that process has since been changed, but as you have pointed out, John was there for a longer period of time. Mr Doyle was there for a longer period of time. He was there for almost two years before his first audit. That's right. Okay. And in August 2013, we're going back now, remembering he started in May 2013. In August 2013, not long after he started, um, RI Advice Group received a complaint about Mr Doyle, didn't they? Uh, I'm, I'm unsure, I don't recall that. Mate. Well, could I show you a sure. document, Mr Werrett, which mm -hmm. is ANZ 800 Have you seen this document before, Mr Werrett? Well, I can't say I've seen the exact document, but I'm reading through it now. Do you see it's a complaint directed to RI Advice Group by a client on the 7th of August 2013? And the client uh, tells RI Advice Group in this letter that she dismissed Mr Doyle as her advisor in 2007. Do you see that in the second paragraph? Yes, I can. But that he continued charging her ongoing fees after that time? That's correct. And the overcharging amounted to about $1,650? Yes. And did ANZ or RI Advice Group refund that amount to the customer? Again, not being, not being able to recall the details of this particular complaint, I'm unab unable to answer that one. Shouldn't this complaint have indicated that there was a need to conduct an early audit of Mr Doyle's files, certainly um, before two years had passed? Well, I, I don't think it's acceptable for someone not to have an audit for a two year period. I believe a flag like this is certainly an early indicator that you need to, to have a look at the files. So why did that not occur? I'm unsure. The process at the time was waiting for people to clear vetting. Um, that process is not good enough um, for us. We have made those modifications. I tender that document, Commissioner. Complaint letter 7 August 2013 concerning Doyle ANZ 800 283 0043 exhibit 2.138. I'm about to turn to the results of the audit uh, conducted in uh, February 2015, which is the start of a new topic, uh, Commissioner. If Probably it's an better if we time. resume at two o'clock, I think, Ms. Orr. Thank you, Commissioner. Come back into the witness box, thank you. Yes, Ms. All. Mr. Werrett, before the break, I said I was going to go to the results of the audit that was conducted in relation to Mr. Doyle uh, in February 2015. You've annexed the results of that audit to your witness statement at Exhibit 1, ANZ 100 008 0935 0001. Uh, we see from this document, um, Mr Whereat, uh, that the review was conducted on the 3rd of February 2015 and it was a review of five client files for Mr Doyle. Is that right? That's right. Uh, and how were those five client files selected? They're selected um, by the Advice Assurance Officer and they're out of um, Mr Doyle's selections. Out of Mr Doyle's? Sorry, they're, they're selected by the, they should be selected by the, um, the advice assurance officer, which is an ANZ um, employee, and they are selected at random for advice given in the preceding 12 month period. So that, that's the usual process. That but is that, the usual process. That wasn't the process here in relation to Mr Doyle? Uh, that's what I understand, yes. Yes, so if we turn to 0002. Uh, 
we see an audit note. The files provided for this review were selected by Mr John Doyle on the 2nd of February 2015. This is outside of the standard file selection process for ANZ Global Wealth Advice Assurance. Pre-selected files from Advice Assurance Officers list were unable to be provided by Mr John Doyle on the day of the audit. That's correct. Is that satisfactory, Mr Werrett? No, it's not. Mm -hmm. uh, but nonetheless, the audit proceeded on the basis of the five files selected by Mr Doyle? That's right. Um, there wasn't a decision made to postpone the audit to another date when the randomly selected files would be available? No. Uh, and based on the files selected by Mr Doyle, Mr Doyle received an advice quality rating of five. We see that at 0003. Do you see that, Mr yes, Werrett? Can. What does an advice quality rating of five mean? It's a failed audit. A rating of five is the worst possible rating in a scale of one to five? Yes, it is. And it meant that there were more than five high-rated issues identified across these files? That's right. So in, in this audit, Mr Doyle had nine high-rated issues, 17 medium-rated issues and four low-rated issues. That's correct. What's a high-rated issue? Uh, it's the, the scoring system between low, medium and high is around the advice quality, so the output, and a high issue is one that we believe is a contributor to poor advice outcomes. A contributor to poor advice outcomes. What about a medium? Uh, a medium and lows are genera generally associated with more um, failure to document because we're, we're having a look at the file. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, uh, each of the uh, scoring systems, we're really looking for those high issues. Mm -hmm. Let's look at one of the high issues identified for Mr Doyle at 0006. We see the third row relates to high rated issues. And do you see in the final column that there was no evidence on the file to support that the planner has completed RI licensee approved risk profile questionnaire? Yes, I can. So no evidence to suggest that Mr Doyle had assessed the risk profile of the client? No, no evidence that it was assessed under yeah. the RI um, template. I see. Recognition and that there was an older profile. Yes, I see. And that was rated a high risk issue? That's right. And if we look at one of the medium rated issues at 0011. We see there that a medium rated issue at the top of the page on the right hand column was that the statement of advice recommended that the clients take out a 100% LVR. An LVR? Loan valuation ratio mm -hmm. via the recommended margin lending facility which is outside of the RI policy guidelines with anything above 50 per cent of loan, value ra loan to value ratio requiring a business case. No documented approval on file. You see that? That's correct. Mm -hmm. And another of the high rated issues at 0016. In the second row, we see that Mr Doyle made a recommendation to maintain some insurance cover within Catholic Super and transfer over to fixed cover, but no evidence of approval being sought to recommend a non-APL product was found on the file. So a non-APL product is a product that's not on the RI Advice Group approved product list? That's correct. Thank you. And as a result of this audit, we see at 0018, that RI Advice Group required Mr Doyle to undertake a number of mandatory remedial actions? Yes. And they had to be taken in relation to each of the files that were audited? That's correct. And at 0022, 
we see that RI Advice Group required Mr Doyle at the top of the page to commence a pre-vet program. Is that right? That's correct. Did that mean that he was required to submit all his advice documents to a vetting officer for review? Prior to them going out to clients, yes. Thank you. Um, so that's what it means when we talk about advice being pre-vetted? That's right. Thank you. Now, can I take you to ANZ 8001653273? This is the advice vetting standard for RI advice group at the relevant time in September 2013. Yes. Mm -hmm. And if we turn to 3276. <coughs> we see the purpose of pre-vetting and the third paragraph down it assesses all parts of the advice process up to but excluding the presentation and implementation of advice. It involves the submission of a proposed statement of, of advice and supporting documents to advice assurance for review. And advice assurance then assesses the proposed advice and determines when he, whether any issues are present and any issues are reported back to the advisor to correct before presenting the advice to the client. That's, right. That's how the pre-vetting process worked? Yes. And at 3277, <coughs> um, we see under the heading approved, under the heading above that vetting outcome, to receive an approved rating from pre-vetting, the file must not have any high rated issues or three or more medium rated issues. That's correct. And it, the following page, 3278, we see that through the pre-vetting process, the other outcome is not approved towards the top of the page and to receive not approved, the file has at least one high issue or three or more medium rated issues. That's correct. I tender that document, Commissioner. Advice vetting standard, May 2013, ANZ 800-165-3273 is exhibit 2.139. Mr Doyle's audit results in that audit we've just discussed were discussed at a meeting of the RI Advice Risk Forum on the 30th of April 2015, which you attended. <coughs> I'm sorry? Yes. Yes. Um, you were the CEO of RI Advice Group at this time. That's right. Yes. And you've exhibited a document about that risk forum meeting at Exhibit 4 of your statement, which is uh, uh, ANZ 800 I'm sorry, that's the agenda for the meeting and the report itself is at Exhibit 3, which is ANZ 800 3700 And we see it 0525 in that document. Under the advice, it, under the executive summary for advice assurance and vetting, um, third dot point down, the increase in a number of the high and medium rated issues for the period was skewed by the results from John Doyle's advice assurance review in February 2015. That's correct. So at this meeting it was recognised that Mr Doyle's results were so significant that they had skewed the results across the business? Yes. But at that time, the only step that RI Advice Group took in relation to Mr Doyle was to require him to submit his advice for pre-vetting. So, uh, in addition to the pre-vetting uh, that Mr Doyle was placed upon, there was also 
uh, supervision by our practice development managers, more frequent supervision required by our practice development manager. How much more frequent, Mr Werrett? Uh, my understanding in pulling this together is that there would need to be uh, vi more frequent visits than we would normally pay to an advisor. So I can't quantify. What I know is that he was on the added supervision post that first failed audit. And how many visits are normally paid if you're not on enhanced supervision? Well, it depends on the type of uh, business, but generally speaking, the supervisors would be in or around or in contact with the advisors uh, probably at least quarterly, if not for the, our bigger businesses, monthly. And we're talking about the RI advice group business or are we talking about the business run by Mr Doyle? So, no, so we're talking about the RI business there, but certainly in terms of our supervision into Mr Doyle's business, uh, I do recall uh, that first failure certainly uh, made us aware that uh, we needed to be more visible and in Mr Doyle's office. So you say there was greater supervision. That greater supervision wasn't successful, was it? Based on the entirety of the file, no. No. So there was a further audit in May and June of 2015, which again involved five of Mr Doyle's client files. That's right. And. Uh, this was a targeted review this time rather than a routine review, is that, that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And we see the results of that audit um, at Exhibit 6 to your statement, which is ANZ 100 008 0927 0001. This is a letter sent to Mr Doyle on the 18th of June 2015. Uh, and if we turn to 0002, we see the advice quality rating that Mr Doyle received. It was not applicable, five equivalent. What, what does that mean, Mr Werrett? Uh, at the time, the targeted reviews weren't equating to, uh, or weren't scored, uh, but uh, we've changed that process since such that we score them exactly the same way we would score a normal audit. What this is saying is, if you, were to, if you were to rate this as a normal audit, it would be another five rated audit. But why weren't the targeted reviews scored? Uh, again, what we're looking at when we go into the targeted reviews is we're looking, um, we're actually looking a lot deeper than we would normally look in, in terms of the audit. Mm. Uh, the process is better aligned today in terms of the target review and our audit system. But what this clearly shows is by a second failed audit, both equivalent to number five for the target review and five for the first review, uh, that the files that we had selected were not acceptable. Well, this time, Mr Doyle, we can see had 27 high rated issues, 24 medium rated issues and six low rated issues. That's correct. So these results were much worse than the results from the previous audit? <coughs> yes. Mm -hmm. And one of the high rated issues was again recommending products that weren't on your approved product list? I can show you the page if you'd like to see if that, Mr Ware. It's 0004. Yes, it recognises that. So there were a range of high and medium rated issues um, which were not dissimilar to the issues identified in the previous audit. Do you agree with that? I do. And there were failures to provide financial services guides. Yep. And that's a breach of the Corporations Act. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were failures to provide statements of advice documenting the advice given. That's right. None of the files that we audited had evidence uh, in them of doing both of those things. Mm -hmm. None of the files. Oh, sorry, the files that have been picked up. Yes. And we see at 0026, <coughs> that a 
low rated issue there was a failure to provide a statement of advice documenting the advice given. I may not have the right page reference to that if you'd give me a moment, uh, Mr Werrett. We'll look for that. Um, can I ask you while we look for that to turn to 0028? And we see again there were a series of mandated remedial actions in relation to each of the client files that were reviewed as part of this audit. That's correct. Okay. Four days after this document, on the 22nd of June 2015, you wrote a letter to Mr Doyle's firm in your capacity as CEO of RI Advice Group? That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll turn to that letter, which is at Exhibit 7 of your statement, ANZ 800 382 Uh, this is the letter you wrote on the 22nd of June 2015, Mr Werrett? Yes. And do you see at the top here that you formally gave notice that RI Advice Group was exercising its rights pursuant to Clause 16.7 <coughs> of the Principal Authorised Representative Agreements in respect of the Carrington Corporation Proprietary Limited to terminate those agreements? I note that termination pursuant to that clause takes effect at the end of a period of six months from the giving of this notice, being 21 December 2015. So by this letter, you terminated the authorised representative status of Mr Doyle's company? Uh, we gave notice to terminate um, with effect from, from that date, yes. Yes, the termination didn't take effect for six months. That's right. And that was because you relied on the provision in the authorised representative agreement that allowed termination on six months' notice. That's right. Our, uh, the files that we had reviewed as the audits indicate his failure to document and evidence uh, the basis for that advice meant that we really couldn't conclude exactly um, the issues that John had in his business. So we used the six month clause uh, four days after those results were available to us. What do you mean when you say you couldn't conclude the issues? So he had failed two consecutive audits, yep. achieving the worst rating available yep. with a range of problems across each of the files that were looked at. Yes. Um, it was sufficient for his authorised representative agreement to be terminated, was it not? At that stage, uh, and, and looking back now, um, certainly at that time, we felt that the process associated with John being able to substantiate additional information through the files would take too long. Um, so we issued our six month clause to ensure that we had given him the right amount of notice. <coughs> but in hindsight, and having a look at the breadth of files, Yes, I do believe we had sufficient information at that time. Sufficient information to what? To, to terminate with cause. What, and are you drawing a distinction between terminating with six months notice and terminating with cause? After considering the breadth of the file that I've had so in your, preparing your, this statement. Is your evidence now that looking back at this, you think he should have been terminated with immediate effect rather than on six months notice? No. 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 I'm, with the benefit of having a look at the entire file, yes. then certainly you can see a pattern in a thematic. Our, our driver at this stage was we his failure to document and the evidence of the files, we just couldn't work out definitively whether we had that uh, reason to terminate for cause. So at this time on the 22nd of June, we were terminating without cause. Obviously with the benefit of hindsight and all the information available to me, some of that is post dated to this letter. Well, much of it's not, isn't it, Mr Wera? The fact that he had failed his competency requirements on his entry into the business was known? It was known, yes. And the fact that he'd been the subject of a customer complaint was known? Yes. As was the fact that he had achieved the lowest rating possible 
on the only two audits conducted in his time with the business? Yes. Okay. Can I take you back to the um, principal authorised uh, representative agreement that you had in place with Mr Doyle's company, which we've already looked at. It's ANZ 800 447 Thank you. And can I take you to the clause that you relied on in that um, agreement, which is at 0206? It was 16.7 that you relied on, which said that you could terminate the agreement by giving six months written notice of termination to the representative after which termination will occur unless otherwise agreed by the representative. The representative is not entitled to challenge any such termination. That was the clause you relied on? Yes, it is. Um, why didn't you suspend Mr Doyle immediately? The, the deeds uh, certainly, in our view, didn't give us sufficient power to step in and suspend. All right, can I show you the deed? Sure. Uh, ANZ 800 447 0157. This is Mr Doyle's individual representative deed with RI Advice Group. Yes. And can I ask you to look at clause eight at 0165? See the suspension clause there in clause eight, which says that without limiting rights under another clause, RI advice group can suspend the individual representative's appointment under the deed for any period during which a breach of any provision of this deed that relates to a breach of the Corporations Act, any other regulation, law or instrument, or to a material breach of the manual or any guide or instructions has not been remedied to RI advice group's reasonable satisfaction, or the individual representative is suspended under any other agreement that it has entered into with RI advice group. Couldn't RI advice group have relied on this provision and suspended Mr Doyle while he remedied or attempted, attempted to remedy the issues in the audits? Yes, we could have. And why did you not do that? I'm unsure why we went with uh, clause 16.7 at the time. If you'd exercised your rights under this clause, we see just before clause nine starts, that the effect would have been that Mr Doyle would have been prevented from performing any act as RI advice group's authorised representative during the period of suspension. That's correct. But you did not exercise your rights under this clause? No, we didn't. I tender that document, Commissioner. Individual representatives deed with Doyle, hands at 800 0157, exhibit 2.140. Come back to the letter that you sent to Mr Doyle at Exhibit 7, ANZ 800 382 You see in the second paragraph there you said to Mr Doyle, it's important that we remind you that by giving this notice, you are not absolved of any of your duties under either of the principal authorised representative agreements or your individual representative deed. All of those obligations remain in force during the notice period and many of the obligations, including in relation to confidential information, continue beyond the termination of those agreements and deed. So by this time, Mr Doyle had had one audit with nine high rated issues and 17 medium rated issues. 
um, which was so significant that it had skewed the results across the business. And he'd had a second audit a few months later with 27 high rated issues and 24 medium rated issues. And he'd also been placed on your RI advice group on watch list. Is that right? That's right. What basis did you have to trust that Mr Doyle would faithfully and diligently comply with his obligations under the agreement deed and at law? And that, I, I ask you that question noting that that is the language that you used in the final paragraph of the letter. We trust that you will faithfully and diligently comply with all of your obligations under the agreement deed and at law. My recollection of the time in terms of our motivation for this was we it was clear to fail audits. We wanted to um, <coughs> ensure John was reminded of his obligations in terms of both of those deeds. In addition to that, we did put some added support into the business uh, in July in and around his uh, some power planning services so that we could improve the quality of his files, which clearly weren't up to to our standards mm. uh, and f from that aspect at the time uh, I certainly would acknowledge that we could have done better and we should do better. Well but Mr Doyle had already demonstrated that he wasn't capable of complying with the obligations that you refer to in this letter hadn't he? Uh, certainly the state of his files would indicate that yes but you allowed him to carry on providing advice to clients for another six months after this time. So, yes, John was uh, able to give vetted advice mm -hmm. um, to his clients. Mm -hmm. And we, as the statement will show, took some more affirmative action um, at that time frame that you mentioned. But Yes, John was able to offer advice during that period. He was able to offer advice, but the pre-vetting requirement was in place. Yes, it was. Thank you. In a, yeah. And two days after this letter, um, ASIC sent RI Advice Group a notice under Section 912C of the Corporations Act. That's right. Uh, and under that notice, RI Advice Group was required to provide ASIC with a written statement about certain matters. Yes, we needed to respond and ASIC specifically sought information about Carrington and Mr Doyle. That's correct. And RI Advice Group responded to that notice? Yes, we did. And did RI Advice Group ask ASIC why it was seeking information about Carrington and Mr Doyle? I'm unsure what conversations were had with ASIC, certainly none by me directly. Well, wh why are you unsure, Mr Werrett? You were the CEO of RI Advice Group at this time and ASIC has sent a notice to RI Advice Group seeking information about Carrington and John Doyle. Are you saying you don't know whether anyone had any discussions with ASIC about why they were interested in Carrington and John Doyle? The, the liaison point of our business back into ASIC um, is managed by another individual. Um, I wouldn't like to speculate in terms of whether that conversation had been had, but certainly I know we did respond back to ASIC and we had regular dialogue with ASIC over a long period of time in regards to Mr Doyle. And was there any increased vigilance in relation to the advice that Mr Doyle was giving after this communication from ASIC that indicated their focus on Mr Doyle and Carrington? So the, uh, the power planning services that we had put into the business, we also, that was to re-engineer his processes. Um, we also had two other resources um, to complete and document the files prior to them being sent into pre-vet. Mm -hmm. And in July, uh, only a month later, you conducted another audit in relation to Mr Doyle. Yes, we did. And this was an audit of six more files? Uh, was it six? I'm just... I'll, I'll show you. It's sure. dealt with in your Exhibit 9. Yep. Uh, which is ANZ 100 
I'm sorry, I've taken us one document ahead. Um, the audit is referred to in 4.8 of your statement and it's Exhibit 8 of Thank your you. statement, which is ANZ. Uh, yes, I can care. It was six files. Yes, six files. I'm sorry. Um, and uh, the audit identified further issues of similar kinds to those that had been identified before? Yes, it did. And this audit showed, did it not, Mr Werrett, that Mr Doyle had not been submitting his advice documents for pre-vetting? That is correct. Mm -hmm. And on the 25th of August 2015, you wrote another letter to Mr Doyle, which is what we have on the screen at the moment. Uh, that's Exhibit 9 to your statement. Yes, it is. And this time, you suspended Mr Doyle's appointment under the individual representative deed effective immediately. That's correct. And you did so on the basis of breaches of the Corporations Act that you've listed in the letter that were evident in some of the 16 files that had now been reviewed across the three audits. That's correct. And that permitted you to suspend his appointment under the clause that we looked at before, Clause 8A of the Individual Representative Deed? Yes. Mm -hmm. And the breaches of the Corporations Act that you identified included breaches of the best interest duty, the obligation to give a statement of advice, the obligation to give product disclosure statements and the obligation to give fee disclosure agreements. That's correct. But you allowed Mr Doyle to remain in the business after the suspension, did you not, Mr Weirat? He was licensed. But you allowed him to continue providing advice to existing clients after this suspension? We did. We uh, suspended um, John and enabled him to give advice to his existing clients or at our direction to remediate the files that we needed and the clients that we needed him to work with. Well, the conditions that you imposed in this letter were that he could provide advice to existing clients as long as the client approached him That's seeking right. advice and the advice was pre-vetted. That's right. Even though you'd seen that the pre-vetting requirement had been ignored by Mr Doyle previously. Mr Doyle uh, had gone outside the pre-vet control. Mm -hmm. um, we have since uh, recognised um, that is uh, unacceptable from a control aspect um, and we've moved to uh, ensure that we are, for those advisors on vetting, uh, contacted monthly to remind it of their processes, etc. So what you're actually showing is um, a, a learning from the process to, to make sure that our, uh, our process continue to change. But certainly, as you say, Mr Doyle, yes. I want to put to you that there should have been learning at the time because you suspended him because he had not complied with your pre-vetting requirement and then you continued to permit him to provide advice as long as he submitted his advice for pre-vetting. Yes, that's true. How was it consistent with the clause I took you with earlier in the individual representative deed, clause eight, how was it consistent with that clause for you to permit him to provide advice while he had been suspended? I'm unsure of the legalities associated with that. Um, our intention here was to ensure that those clients that were already in John's business um, with our vetting controls, our taking control of his diary, uh, were enabling us to correct any issues that he had created through his failure to document uh, and also those other issues highlighted in the audits. But you were purporting to suspend him by this letter. And if we just bring up again on the other side of the screen, 800, ANZ 800 Ah, We have it there. We see that the final sentence in clause eight makes very clear that after suspension, the individual representative must not perform any act 
as RI advice groups authorise representative during the period of suspension. That's what it says, yes. But you, despite this clause, permitted him to continue providing advice while suspended? Yes. Do you accept that that was a mistake? I accept that that is a mistake. It was unacceptable, wasn't it? It was Mr. unacceptable. Wirat? Approximately how many existing clients did Mr Doyle have at this time? Uh, he... Uh, around about 700 in his uh, business at that stage. So you permitted him to continue providing advice to up to 700 clients even though at this point your concerns about his conduct were not only sufficiently serious to warrant suspension, but also to warrant a report to ASIC on the basis that there was a potential significant breach under section 912D of the Corporations Act. We, yes, with the um, controls that I've mentioned um, in and around John's business, yes. Yes, so it was the 31st of August, about a week after this letter, when you wrote to ASIC notifying them of that breach, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. um, we saw earlier Mr Werrett in the documents that were submitted by Mr Doyle when he commenced with RI Advice Group that he indicated that he was a member of a variety of um, professional associations, including the AFA and the FPA. Did you report his conduct to the AFA or the FPA? I'm unaware of what um, information was exchanged with either of those associations. Well, Mr Werrett, you were the CEO at the time and you've been put forward to give evidence about Mr John Doyle. Are you unable to tell us whether any report was made to either of the two professional associations of which Mr Doyle was a member? I'm, I'm un unable to confirm that. I have, in the entirety of the file and the exhibits that I've done, there's no evidence that that was done. Thank you. Um, did you consider that this pre-vetting requirement that you imposed on Mr Doyle would protect his clients from receiving inappropriate advice? Uh, at the time, yes, we um, certainly believe the ability to vet the file prior to it getting the to the client um, is an important part to ensure that the clients are getting the right advice, yes. Well, I want to put to you that by this time when you were imposing these pre-vetting requirements on Mr Doyle, your business knew that pre-vetting was an ineffective control mechanism, not just for Mr Doyle, but for all advisers? Uh, certainly we acknowledge that the control for uh, vetting needed to be uh, tightened because, as you suggested, it could be circumvented. What I would note in Mr Doyle's case that since we did put the power planning resources into his business, some 300 odd plans during uh, just over a 12 month period were in fact vetted prior to going to clients. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, you accept my proposition that across the business you knew by this point that pre-vetting was not an effective control to prevent inappropriate advice? Certainly in the instance of Mr Doyle. No, I'm not talking about Mr Doyle, I'm talking about at a business level I wouldn't say at a business level we didn't believe it is an effective control. Um, in the case of Mr Doyle, he was operating outside of the uh, process that had been designed, so I acknowledge it for him. Yes, no, I'm not talking about his circumvention of pre-vetting. I'm talking about the business's knowledge that this was not a useful measure to protect clients. Perhaps if I just show you sure. uh, a document that you've annexed to your statement at uh, Exhibit 48, which is ANZ 800 225 1484. This is a report to the Risk and Compliance Board Committee of Financial Services Partners, Millennium 3, RI Advice Group and Elders Financial Planning. Uh, uh, it's for a meeting on the 17th of August 2015. Yes. You attended this meeting, Mr Werrett?
Have we got the attendee listed there? No, it's not part of this document, uh, but there's a reference to you in the meeting that we'll come to. But can I just point out first that the meeting was on the 17th of August 2015, which was eight days before you sent the letter suspending Mr Doyle. And if we could turn to 1500. We see there keys con key controls testing. Key controls testing status is as follows. Ineffective controls. Pre-vetting, this control is rated ineffective in that it can be circumvented. The pre-vet team distribute a listing of advisers on vetting each month. However, as this listing is not validated by the ADGs, the aligned dealer groups, we cannot confirm that advisers on pre-vet are not writing business without submitting to pre-vet for clearance. And you're listed as one of the owners of this issue, Mr Whereat. Yes, I acknowledge that. Yes, thank you. Um, was this issue with the ineffectiveness of pre-vetting as a control fixed while Mr Doyle was an authorised representative of RI Advice Group? I'm unsure of when the changes were, were specifically made. Uh, the controls put into the Carrington business were not usual in terms of us putting power planners directly into the business. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm unable to specifically state that. So while Mr Doyle was suspended, you conducted an investigation into his conduct, is that right? That is right. Uh, and in November 2015, our advice group extended Mr Doyle's authorisation. So November 2015 was the end of the six month period that we had seen before after uh, for termination. But instead of terminating him in November 2015, there was an extension of his authorisation until June 2016. Why? Uh, we were considering a number of options uh, for John um, and, and John's business. And the view taken at the time was for if we could find a buyer for his business, um, one that specialised in the market that Carrington operated in, which uh, then we would have a more effective solution in terms of the client because we would have a business that we could continue to work with to remediate the issues that we had found. Um, and then we could also uh, terminate John uh, and Carrington business as of the 30th of June, 2016. So you were trying to sort out a buyer for his business, but in the meantime, for another six months, he was permitted to provide advice to his 700 odd existing clients? Uh, yes, he was. Mm -hmm. And in February 2016, partway through that period, uh, a draft investigation report was produced? Uh, that's right. And you got a copy of that report? Yes, I did. And that report is Exhibit 11 to your statement, ANZ 800 382 0003. And at uh, 0007 of that document, You see at the top issue concern that in addition to the possible breaches of the Corporations Act on, and based on information from bu the business, there were concerns there could be considerable client detriment due to the advice provided by John Doyle for clients to roll over funds from a defined benefit scheme to a self-managed superannuation fund. And 11 clients were identified as having been provided this type of advice. Uh, and an investigation of 11, those 11 files uh, suggested that there was insufficient documentation to determine their objectives, the client's objectives, financial situation and needs, and therefore you were unable to prove that Mr Doyle had satisfied the best interest duty. That's correct. Mm -hmm. uh, and at 0022,
the investigation uh, was unable to conclude whether there was any detriment to the clients who'd been given the SMSF advice. <coughs> Yes. Uh, and in order to work out whether there had been detriment, it was necessary to re-engage with the clients? Yes. And we see from 0043 that most of Mr Doyle's defined benefits clients were teachers and public servants. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And at 0023 we see that a further issue was identified during the investigation, and that was that Mr Doyle had provided advice to clients about structured products that were not on ANZ's approved product list. That's correct. And there's a reference there to two types of structured products, the in-street products and the Macquarie Flexi 100 Trust. Yes. And following this draft investigation report, the advice review team reviewed the files of 21 of Mr Doyle's clients who'd invested in the in-street products. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, now, before I come to the report of the advice review team about their findings, I just want to ask you some questions about structured products and ANZ's approved product list. Can you explain firstly what a structured product is? Generally speaking, it's a product that involves a high degree or a degree of gearing um, to invest and get, have exposure to generally an index like a share market. Mm -hmm. And you had at RI Advice Group an approved products list? Yes. And what process did advisors need to follow if they were to recommend a product that wasn't on the approved product list? They needed to send that information into the advice research team for that product to both be reviewed. Now that review may have been done by an external research house if there were some ratings there. And if there wasn't a rating, then the advice research team would do that themselves. Um, to determine suitability, if you like, for the product and, were and the, the client. Were the in-street products on the approved product list? No, they weren't. And the in-street products were a geared, structured investment that took the form of a three-year deferred purchase agreement? Yes. And a decision was made by RI Advice Group not to include the in-street in products on the approved product list because of both the complexity of the product and the advice risk around the product? Yes. And Mr Doyle requested a waiver permitting him to recommend the in-street products in June 2013. Sure. a document started with RI Advice Group in May 2013? Yes, he did. All right. Um, the Macquarie Flexi 100 product, was that on the approved product list? No. Why not? Uh, again, for the reasons that you gave for in-street. Um, complexity and risk. Complexity and risk. And they were also, the Macquarie Flexi 100 products were also geared structured investments? Yes. Uh, and Mr Doyle also asked for a waiver permitting him to recommend the Macquarie Flexi 100 products in 2013? That's correct. And this time he was given approval to recommend those products under certain circumstances for an 18-month period? That's right. The waiver was for the period um, that you have mentioned with some added restrictions around the amount of exposure that certain clients and their risk profile could have. So why was that waiver granted? Uh, the, the structured products... Um, are suitable to some clients, clearly if they've got those needs and objectives uh, and the product actually matches up to them. Okay. I mentioned earlier that the advice review team reviewed 21 of Mr Doyle's files um, for clients who'd invested in the in-street products. 
could I ask you to look at Exhibit 12 to your statement, which is ANZ 100 0080931 0001, which is a report of the review conducted by the advice review team. And on the first page there, 0001, we see that uh, in June 2013, second paragraph, soon after Carrington was licensed, the CIO, who are the CIO? Uh, the Chief Investment Office. So the Chief Investment Office refused the waiver for in street on the basis of complexity inherent risk. Despite this, a new series of this investment commencing in June 2014 was recommended by Carrington to a number of clients. These investments were not authorised and not appropriate. That's correct. Mm -hmm. So at the time of this report in April 2016, Mr Doyle's clients had the option to walk away from the in-street investments because they could give notice before a particular time. They had approximately one month to give notice at this time. Do you agree with that? I agree. Um, and that's why this document records on the second page um, that the in-street investments require swift action. Is that right? Yes, they were time bound to yes. give that advice. And following this report, in April 2016, there was a meeting between the acting CEO of <coughs> RI Advice Group and Mr Doyle. Yes. Yes. Can I show you an email? The acting CEO was Mr Ornsby, is that right? Correct, yes. Uh, an email which is ANZ 800-450-0039. So do you see there that there's been a meeting last Thursday between the acting CEO and Mr Doyle? And the acting CEO tells Mr Doyle that his clients who held investments in the in-street products would have all the fees they had paid in connection with those investments refunded. Do you see that reference? It's, it's yes. number two Paragraph in the document. Two. Yes. yes. Um, then the acting CEO later says to Mr Doyle uh, in this email, um, please do not discuss RI's in reimbursement intentions with any impacted client. Do you see that? It's in the same paragraph, Mr Werrett. Yes. Um, why not? I'm unsure of the, the motivation for that commentary in there. Why, why would the time. CEO of RI Advice Group be telling the advisor not to let the clients know that they were going to receive refunds? I'm, I'm unaware as to why that approach was taken. Okay. And also in this email we see in paragraph three the acting CEO telling Mr Doyle that his business is going to be required to indemnify RI Advice Group for any customer remediation. That's correct. Okay. So in this same month, in the month when Mr Doyle's clients could get out of the in-street products, Mr Doyle contacted all 21 of his clients who had an investment in an in-street product and told them to remain invested. Yes, he did. Mm -hmm. Was this advice that was submitted for pre-vetting? No, it was not. Mm -hmm. It was advice for clients to remain invested in a product that RI Advice Group had decided should not be included on the approved product list and for which RI Advice Group had decided all fees paid by customers should be refunded. That's correct. Mm -hmm. This was further inappropriate advice by Mr Doyle, wasn't it? Yes, it was. So the measures that RI Advice Group put in place to protect Mr Doyle's clients from inappropriate advice while he was suspended were inadequate, weren't they? Yes, they were. And when did RI Advice Group first form the view that it was necessary to remediate Mr Doyle's clients? 
the remediation for Mr Doyle's, all his clients. Um, as you can see from the audits, there's, there's often remediation that needs to be done. I think it's fair to say that by that third review, the one that we referred to a little bit earlier, um, conducted by Adrian Casper, um, that we would need to review all of Mr Doyle's advice to determine whether the clients needed to be remediated. You're talking about the third audit? Yes. Yes, in July, was it, 2015? Uh, I think it was a little bit later in the year, if I can just check my yes, timeline. Yes, please, thank you. Uh, July 2015, you're thank exactly you. right. And in July 2016, Mr Doyle sold the business. He sold Carrington to a new owner. Uh, with effect from the 1st of July, yes. 16. And after Mr Doyle sold Carrington, RI Advice Group and the new owner commenced a remediation plan? Yes, we've been working with the new owner um, to systematically go through each of the clients to review the suitability of the advice and determine whether there is remediation. So required. have you been working with the new owner on remediation for Mr Doyle's clients since that time, since July 2016? Yes. And you've been reporting to ASIC about your progress since then? Uh, my investigations tell me that each quarter we've been providing ASIC with an update in regards to the remediation activities for Carrington. Mm -hmm. now, I want to put to you that in August 2016 you told ASIC that you were still in the identification and scoping phase of the remediation project? Uh, within the remediation project, yes. Uh, and as late as April 2017, you were still telling ASIC that you were in the identification and scoping phase of the project? Yes. And in June 2017, almost a year after the sale of the business, uh, the advice review team produced an internal status update. Uh, You've exactly. annexed this to your statement, Mr Werrett, yep. at Exhibit 14. Thank you. It's ANZ 800 221 4305. Yep, in the 5th of June 2017, that's correct. Yes, so this was an update for ASIC and it identified um, on this page four main categories of concern in relation to Mr Doyle's advice. We can see the first three and the fourth is on the following page. Do yes. you see that? Um, and we see at that second page, 4306, that the review and remediation program was given a low priority. Do you see under the heading prioritisation? Yes. Um, potential client detriment low due to the type of investments and the market movements over the years, Jay Doyle with, with RI. The one area of expected detriment is in street, lower priority. Vulnerability, the client base is broadly retired school teachers. This group is generally financially literate and there do not appear to be clients who would consider to be vulnerable, lower priority. Increasing detriment, as the clients are being reviewed by the practice an end date for remediation is being formulated and thus if there were detriment it is less likely to increase, lower priority. ASIC interest, evident, increases priority. We see that there, Mr Werrett? Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. um, could we just have 4307, the following page on the screen as well? We see the continuation of that list there are approximately 200 clients, which puts it into a medium category for this factor. Could we perhaps have both these pages on the screen at the one time so you can see the list? Age, age of the event or the incident, I assume, reported in September 2015. This increases the priority. Reputation, there is nothing to suggest that the Carrington practice is high profile, lower priority. 
fraud, there is no evidence <coughs> of fraud, lower priority. So this was the assessment made by ANZ and RI um, advice group of the level of priority to be given to remediation of Mr Doyle's clients. Uh, so this report uh, and the prioritisation, the audience was the uh, the RGF, so the Internal um, Governance Framework for Remediation. What this is showing is relative to other events that were in the advice review team at the time. Yes. We have a, a matrix to, to obviously prioritise those events that we need to work towards. Um, and this is a report um, done within the review team, um, substantiating the uh, position of Carrington relative to other events at the time. So relative to other misconduct by financial advisors, the remediation of Mr Doyle's clients was a low priority. So lower priority. Mm -hmm. um, in that document, it references uh, a number of those categories that we mentioned before. Mm -hmm. uh, the sampling had covered in both the self-managed super fund exposure um, and the defined benefit exposure that there was unlikely to be client detriment. But we do recognise, as does the report, that both um, that the in-street needed to be remediated at the maturity date, which was called um, June 2017. Mm -hmm. So relative with that information, being able to, at this stage, satisfy uh, ourselves that the likelihood of client detriment in those higher risk categories, um, being defined benefit and self-managed super funds, was mitigated. We um, said it was lower priority relative to other events. Mm -hmm. And had you contacted clients in order to find out whether there had been detriment at this stage? So my understanding um, in reading the file is that in a number of cases where the file didn't provide enough information that an, um, that our representative from the advice review team had spoken to a number of clients. I believe it was a small number A very of small clients. number, wasn't very it, small Mr number Ware? Of clients. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in your statement, you also annex an internal report, a report to Carrington actually, on the 23rd of June 2017, mm. around the same time. Uh, and that's exhibit 15 to your statement, ANZ 800 385 mm -hmm. And what we see from that document, I want to put to you, um, Mr Werrett, is that in June 2017, there's still a lot of discussion about contacting Mr Doyle's clients some two years after these problems have first emerged, but very few clients have been contacted at all at this point. Um, contacted by ourselves? Yes. Yes. The, um, however, in, in the background, working with the acquirers of the business, they were actively reviewing uh, each of the clients well, were and they, the suitability of advice. Were they, Mr Werrett? This document says in the second paragraph, having observed at an earlier stage that the advice process for Carrington was deficient and that demonstration of best interest was often lacking, it was agreed that client contact was required in order to establish if their interests were well served by the advice of John Doyle. You're still talking about contacting the clients at this point two years after the events, aren't you? We are. Yes. And it's, it's too long. It's Absolutely too long. Um, it's not until September and when November. Did they, when did that uh, uh, realisation come to you as CEO? Uh, Commissioner, by this stage, I was outside of the, um, the RI business. I wasn't the CEO at the time. In preparing this statement and looking at the files, even with the best of intentions to try and um, make sure the clients did get advice. It's clear that we could have moved much earlier than June 2017. But you didn't move in June 2017, did you, Mr Werrett? No, we didn't. It wasn't until September and November of 2017, which is well over a year after Mr Doyle sold Carrington, more like 18 months mm -hmm. after he sold Carrington, 
that ANZ started preparing client loss assessments in relation to the clients who'd invested in some of the products? Uh, in terms of In Street and Macquarie 100? Yes. Yes. And it was in September last year that RI Advice Group provisioned for $766,000 in compensation to 222 clients of Mr Doyle that it believed may have suffered detriment as a result of his inappropriate advice. Yep, that is, that is certainly the amount that was provisioned. Yes, and that was based on an estimate of the average compensation that would need to be provided to each client of approximately $18,000. Uh, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Can I take you to um, uh, one of the loss assessments that was prepared, Mr Warrett, at your Exhibit 17, ANZ 800 163325? yes. Um, this is a loss assessment prepared by the advice review team in respect of one of Mr Doyle's clients from November 2017. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And at uh, 3325 on this page, we see that in June 2015, do you see the second paragraph down? The client invested via an undocumented transaction in a new Macquarie Flexi 100 investment in June 2015 a structured investment with leveraged exposure of $100,000 to a basket of Australian shares. The investment was not covered by the waiver issued by the CIO in 2013, which allowed for Macquarie Flexi Investment Series until April 2015. The investment was not appropriate for the client due to its complexity and lack of verifiable disclosure. Yep. And at 3328, we see that the client um, was contacted on the 28th of August 2017. Do you see under the heading, was advice provided? Yes, I do. He stated he received an email about the investment, which primarily said that it was a good pick for them and asked them to sign the attached application form. The investment was never discussed in detail. No formal advice document was issued. Additionally, the advisor received an entry fee as well as an ongoing fee on the product. The product was therefore assessed as having been recommended by the advisor. And further down the page, under Just the heading... Just before you leave that, Ms Orr, is the client's name meant to be redacted there? I would have thought it was. It's a shame yes. it wasn't. There will be a, the non-publication direction. Uh, has been given in respect of the client's name. It is regrettable that it's gone up for the name there. Yes. I apologise for that, no, I don't Commissioner. Think the apology lies there, Ms. Orr. The apology lies with me, Commissioner. I do apologise. Yes. Uh, uh, you have that hard copy document in front of I, you, I do. Um, Mr. Werrett. I just wanted to take you to one other part of it under the heading "Advice was not appropriate." There was no advice document that could be relied on and the recommendation was made by email. So we see from this client loss assessment that Mr Doyle recommended this product to this client in June 2015. That's correct. That was after the 1st February 2015 audit. Yes. And it was after the second audit in May 2015. That's right. It was during the period when Mr Doyle was on pre-vetting? Yes, it was. And the pre-vetting failed to stop him from providing this inappropriate advice? That is correct. And the advice review team assessed that this client should receive compensation of $15,000 for this inappropriate advice, didn't they? I think I can take you to um, a page that is 14,725? Yes. yes. A 3332 mm -hmm. is the reference, but we won't bring it up in case the redactions are not in place. Sure. Um, so about three years after the February 2015 audit identified issues with Mr Doyle's advice, 
ANZ is making this payment of just short of $15,000 to this client. Um, and it's almost two years after the report from the February 2016 investigation. That's correct. And that was the report that identified that clients had been inappropriately placed into structured products like this product? Yes. Do you think that the community expects that it will take less than two or three years to remediate people where it's been found that they've been given inappropriate advice? No, I don't. I'm sorry? No, I don't think it's acceptable. You don't think it's acceptable? Absolutely not. Not you acceptable for our clients, not acceptable to community standards, not acceptable to our own standards. Mm -hmm. And in December 2017, RI Advice Group told ASIC that it had reviewed 35 of the 222 clients of Mr Doyle who it had identified as potentially affected by his inappropriate advice. Again, if I can just refresh my memory to get those numbers. Yes, correct. of course. Um, it's Exhibit 30 to your witness statement. It's an email to ASIC dated the 16th of January 2018, which refers to information provided in December 2017. Um, I'll get the doc ID for it. That's okay. <coughs> ANZ 800-382-0362. You've got the table there in front of you oh, that okay. is annexed to that yep. communication with ASIC. And can you see there a reference to having reviewed 35 of 222 clients? You'll need to look yes, for the I entry can. for Mr Doyle. Yep. So how many of those 222 clients has ANZ now reviewed? So we, in working with the acquirer of the business, mm -hmm. uh, I was last informed that um, out of the entire book of John's, which we were talking, which was nearly uh, the 700 odd clients that I mentioned earlier, they have um, reviewed about 400 of those files. And so far you've only paid compensation to 29 clients, is that right? That's right. The, uh, the detriment at this stage in terms of what we found as we review the files is limited to those recommendations that were off the APL, being the In Street and the Macquarie 100 investments. So you've paid the 29 clients so far a total of $415,000 in compensation for the inappropriate advice? Uh, Yes. And that significantly eroded the provision that you made of 766000 that was originally set aside for those 222 clients? Uh, yes, it's taken a fair portion of that, yes. Yes. Will there be a further provision? Uh, again, in terms of how the accounting provisions uh, are being made, our first and foremost aim for the remediation team is to make sure that the clients are remediated. The accounting work that happens behind the scenes to ensure that the provision is there. Obviously the ANZ is a big organisation that wants to make sure that the money's in the client's accounts and or hands as soon as we can possibly do that. You were asked in your statement to address why you think Mr Doyle engaged in this conduct. And the explanation that you gave in your statement is that Mr Doyle was a stubborn man who was convinced that he was acting in his client's best interests and who resolved to act on his views even if it meant exceeding his authority or disobeying an instruction given to him by RI. And you also said that Mr Doyle's advice business practices were sloppy in that he did not consistently do the things required by the Corporations Act to be done. That's, That's correct? That is correct. Does RI Advice Group take any responsibility for the fact that Mr Doyle engaged in this conduct? Yes, we do. Do you we... take any responsibility as the CEO of the organisation through the bulk of this period? Uh, yes, I do. Um, 
In what way do you take responsibility? What do you concede were the failings of RI advice group? The, the entire experience from the onboarding process um, up until we uh, satisfied ourselves at the third audit for mine took too long. Uh, I obviously would like to, to improve and learn from this case study such that um, the processes that you talked about in terms of vetting are, are addressed. For, for mine, we just took too long to, um, to act. And then when we did act, uh, whilst we had the best intentions of our clients to ensure that we had continuity of advice between John and the new owner, who we are actively working um, with, there are instances where in hindsight and with the benefit of that, that we should have made some different decisions. Can I put a series of propositions to you and see if you accept them, Mr Wherat? The first is that you should not have permitted Mr Doyle to provide advice in circumstances where he had failed his competency test at the start of his time with RI Advice Group. I acknowledge that should have been acted upon, yes. Um, when Mr Doyle received the audit results that he received, um, too late as it turns out, because I should say before I get to that, he wasn't audited for two years after he started. That was another failing. Yes. When he was audited, the results that he received should have resulted in stronger action from RI Advice Group. Do you accept that? I do accept that. You should have suspended him and not permitted him to continue providing advice to any of his clients. Do you accept that? I accept that we should have suspended rather than issue that first termination letter, yes. Yes, and when you did suspend him, do you accept that you should have stopped him from providing advice as your contractual documents required you to do? Yes, I acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. And do you accept that pre-vetting was an inadequate way of trying to ensure that he provided uh, appropriate advice? I, I acknowledge that the, the vetting processes at the time certainly enabled um, Carrington to operate outside what we believe to be an effective control. And we have since adjusted those processes, but certainly the file, I can't do anything other than acknowledge that, that John did give advice outside of that vetting. Yes, and that was never going to be a suitable control mechanism for him, was it? Well, at the time, we thought um, it, it was, but clearly it hasn't proven to be. And you took far too long to identify clients who required remediation and to remediate them. It certainly took a long period of time. We absolutely would acknowledge that. Um, we would also um, have liked to have moved a, a lot faster, but the reality of the situation is even though we've remediated those clients right up to the day that the uh, monies were drawn, the length of time that expired is too long. And it was because you placed remediation of Mr Doyle's clients as a lower priority than remediation of other clients of other advisors? That's right. Yes. All right. Um, Before we leave that topic, is all. Can I understand what you say the consequences were for the clients of Mr Doyle? We've heard the description of events. Uh, we've spoken of the fact that there has been or is to be remediation. But what was the consequence for the clients? Uh, Commissioner, as the, the number of clients that we had contacted uh, indicate uh, and the very small number of clients we contacted had indicated that they were comfortable with John's advice. In the reviews that we are working with the new owner of the business, uh, the file reviews that they are conducting in conjunction with us is showing uh, very few uh, instances, in fact, I'm not aware of any of, of advice needing to be unwound. Uh, but certainly the in-street product and the Macquarie 100 product uh, that client experience is nowhere near what it should be. That is, the client was put into an inappropriate investment, is that right? That's right. 
the client was given poor advice in that respect? Yes. The client may have been happy with the advice or unhappy with the advice. The fact is, objectively, the advice was poor. Is that right? Poor for those individual circumstances, yes. yes. And the measure of remediation is what? Uh, the, the remediation framework that we've um, been working with both the regulator and an external firm gives a, a, a set of steps and series of steps that needs to be um, calculated and it puts the aim is to put the client back into the same situation they would be financially had they not have received that advice. Had they not received the advice or had they been given proper advice which? Uh, had they not received the advice. So the client pays for advice, gets poor advice, and is put in the position the client would have been in had no advice been given, is that right? That's right, with an adjustment for, with an adjustment for um, uh, interest returns, etc. The time value of money is yes. taken into account, I understand that. But the client is not put in the position that the client would have been in had he or she been given proper advice. Do I, do I understand this? Yes. Yes, I see. Do you accept also, um, Mr Werrett, that there was a need for increased vigilance right from the start with Mr Doyle because you had recruited him from Australian Financial Services um, an advice body that had been subject to um, ASIC intervention on the basis of advisor misconduct. Yes, I would accept that. And there was no increased vigilance, was there? No. Uh, and we saw in those early documents, in which I referred to at the very start of your evidence, that there were descriptions in those documents of enhanced due diligence that was going to be applied to advisers that came across from Australian Financial Services. Um, where was the enhanced due diligence? Um, having Stephen Blood as the head of compliance review the, uh, or come up with an assessment prior to the authorised reps or the businesses coming on was a, is not a normal step. However, I will acknowledge that once they had passed that gate, if you like, that uh, the, they were subjected to our normal supervision, but I certainly wouldn't say it was enhanced supervision. Thank you. And the enhanced due diligence doesn't sit well with Mr Doyle failing his competency test at the outset, does it? No, it does not. No, thank you. Um, I want to turn to the second advisor you deal with in your statement, Mr Wherat, um, and his name is Christopher Harris. But before I do that, I've neglected to tender one of the documents that I've referred to, which is the email from Peter Ornsby to Mr Doyle on the 19th of May 2016. Which is ANZ 800 yes. 450 will be Exhibit 2.141. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, now, Mr Harris became an authorised representative of a different aligned dealer group, Millennium 3 Financial Services, on the 1st of October 2008. Uh, yes. Um, and we have the authorised representative deed for uh, Mr Harris, which is ANZ 800 And can I show you from 1827 that this is between Millennium 3 and the representative and the authorised representative at 1839 is Mr Harris. I'm sorry, 1839 will come up on the screen, but I'm told that Mr Harris's name has been redacted out of the document. <laughs> I apologise, Commissioner, that's also an error. Um, I'd like you to accept... I'm, I'm, 
from me. Happier if the clients were redacted than the subject was. But there we are. These things happen, I suppose. I, I, I do apologise, Commissioner. I'd like you to accept from me that this is the authorised um, representative deed uh, for Mr. Harris. Mr. Whereat? I'll accept that. Thank you. And I'll tender that document, Commissioner. Uh, exhibit 2.142, authorised representative deed, Millennium 3 and Harris. Uh, ANZ 800 451 1826. Could I ask you to look at ANZ 800 451 1845? And this is a letter dated for June 2008 from Millennium 3 to Mr. Harris. Yes, perhaps if we could have the second page brought up on the screen as well. The deed that I just took you to was dated the 1st of October 2008. So this is a letter several months before that. Um, and do you see it, 1845, the second paragraph, following consultations with a number of FLS advisors, we were encouraged to review the original financial arrangements with a view of sweetening our offer by providing a larger upfront payment. Yes, I can see that. And we see references on the following page to a sign-on payment that is to be paid to Mr Harris's practice on various dates. Correct. And his entitlement to the sign-on payment is conditional with remaining conditional on remaining with Millennium Three for three years. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Why did Millennium Three offer Mr. Harris a sign-on payment? Again, this predates me by a long time. However, uh, in making some investigations, my understanding was that the acquisition of the entire licence wasn't just for Mr. Harris. He was part of a larger licence. Uh, Commercially, money was um, put aside to, um, if you like, ensure that the majority of those advisors moved and stayed with Millennium 3. I see. I tender that document, Commissioner. Exhibit 2.143, letter 4, June 08, Millennium 3 to Harris, ANZ 800 451 1845. Now, so this is 2008 when Mr Harris starts uh, as an authorised representative of Millennium 3. I want to move forward in time to 2013 okay. when Millennium 3 conducted an audit of Mr Harris's files on the 17th of July 2013. Um, and you've annexed to your statement a letter sent to Mr Harris with the outcome of that audit, uh, which is Exhibit 35. ANZ 800 366 1846. And we see from that that like, uh, like Mr Doyle, Mr Harris received an advice quality rating of five. That's correct. And does a rating of five from Millennium Three mean the same thing as a rating of five from RI Advice Group? It does. So it's the lowest available outcome? It is. And in this audit we see from 1848 that Mr Harris had nine high rated issues, two medium rated issues and two low rated issues. That's correct. And at 1856, a series of mandatory remedial actions. And they included submitting advice for pre-vetting. That's correct. And at 1858, there were a series of recommendations made to Mr Harris. And they included that he should consider using the Chant West software to assist in research and product replacement activities. Um, what is the Chant West software? Um, Chant West is a um, independent from our organisation uh, business that uh, researches and rates products within the market that also lists the features and benefits 
aspects uh, within the program. So you can do your to and from responsibilities in terms of comparing um, the fund that you're in to the fund you want to go from. I see. And another recommendation here is that Mr Harris consider using X-Plan for financial modelling purposes. Could you explain what X-Plan is? Uh, X-Plan is, a, again, a piece of software independently um, owned by the IRIS organisation. Uh, quite very prevalent within the uh, advice industry. It's both a CRM and also a software that produces advice documentation. Um, it also, for the licensees, offers the advisors the ability to store their information within the software as well. Having had this audit report, um, there was then a meeting of the Aligned Dealer Group Consequence Management Committee that followed on the 27th of August 2013. Uh, yes. Yes, and you've attached the minutes of that meeting to your statement at Exhibit 35A, which is ANZ 800 166 5078. 5078, yes. And you were present at that meeting? I was in, in my capacity um, for RI, yes. And one of the matters that was discussed at that meeting was Mr Harris. We see that from 5079. That's correct. And we see there a record of Barry Martin mentioning uh, that the advisor has been difficult over the years and is currently in the middle of buying another book of business. The committee agreed that a targeted review should be conducted Stephen Blood is to liaise with Barry to ensure that the review covers both old and any new themes and to provide an update at the next meeting. Once the targeted review has been completed, Barry Martin and or Richard Clippen is to meet with the advisor to determine what additional support may be required to effectively manage the additional book of business which has been acquired. Yes. If I could take you to the next exhibit in your statement, which is 35B at ANZ 800-166-5092. This is a meeting of the same committee on the 1st of October 2013. That's correct. And we see that you attended by telephone? Yes. And Mr Harris is also discussed at this meeting at 5093. And Stephen Blood advises that he's, been ad he's obtained vetting clearance for super and investment advice, but is still on vetting for life risk and retirement planning advice. Targeted review has been scheduled for October. That's correct. Millennium 3 then conducted a targeted audit of another of another 10 of Mr uh, Harris's client files on the 7th of November 2013. That's correct. Right. And we see the results of that audit at your Exhibit 37, which is ANZ 800 366 1860. Yes. And again, with this document, we see an advice quality rating of not applicable. That's because this was a targeted review rather than a routine audit. Uh, that's correct. But we see from, I'll just wait till it comes up on the screen, ANZ 800 385 At 0014, we see that Mr Harris had six high rated issues and one medium rated issue. And again, that there was a series of mandatory remedial actions at 1864, which is, I'm sorry, we've got two different document IDs for this document um, at 0017. Sorry, 0017? Yes. See the mandatory remedial actions there? Yes, I do. Then the next event is another consequence management committee discussing Mr Harris on the 4th of December 2013. 
uh, at ANZ 800 219 your exhibit 37B. Commissioner, I apologise for interrupting. I've just noticed that the page... Clients again, it, yes, haven't we? Yes, might, might an order be made. I do apologise again. Yes. That was on page 0017. I'm sorry, in the document I was moving on from? Yes. yes. Um, so I was taking you to exhibit 37B, ANZ 800 219 Yes to point out that there's another discussion about Mr Harris uh, at the Consequence Management Committee meeting uh, on the 4th of December 2013. We see that from 0330. Yes. Then on the 4th of March 2014, the Consequence Management Committee is told that Mr Harris has failed vetting for super and investments, and he's been placed on extended pre-vetting. You deal with that in your statement. Is yes, that right? That's right. And there's a meeting at which Richard Clippen, who's the CEO of Millennium 3 at that time, says that he's had a conversation with Mr Harris and strongly suggested that he outsource his power planning. Is that right? That is correct. And then on the 10th of April 2014, there's another discussion of Mr Harris at the Consequence Management Committee um, and it's said that he has passed the second stage of vetting and he's now outsourced his, planning, his um, power planning service. That's right. And the committee then resolved that he be cleared from pre-vetting and be reviewed again by July 2014. That's right. And there's an audit conducted in July 2014 of five of his files. Yes. And we see the results of that audit at Exhibit 38, ANZ 800 366 1866. 1866, yes. And this time Mr Harris receives an advice quality rating of two. What does that mean? On a scale of it's a past audit. Mm -hmm. Um, and we see at 1867 that he has one high rated issue and two medium rated issues. That's correct. And on the 8th of August 2014, the Consequence Management Committee decides to close the incident in relation to Mr Harris. Uh, with, the, with the, yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Now, your statement deals with two clients of Mr Harris. Mr Harris gave financial advice to both of those clients following the July 2014 audit and prior to the next audit, which was in June 2015. That's correct. And he met with the first of those clients on the 13th of April 2015. Yes. Now, could I take you to exhibit 120 of your statement, which is ANZ 800 366 0458. And this is the financial, I'm relieved to see that the customer's name is redacted, uh, Commissioner. This is the financial needs analysis um, provided for that client um, by Mr Harris at that meeting. And we see from 0460. We see that... I'm trying to work with the redactions, Commissioner. We see that um, the client is a widow. And you can see, but we can't see the date of birth of the client. I'm going to put to you that based on that date of birth, this client is an elderly widow. That's correct. Okay. I can't see the date, but... And her only income is an aged pension. Yes. Of $840 per fortnight. Correct. And at 0469, we see why she came to see Mr Harris. She had a term deposit in the amount of uh, $32,000. I'll find the reference to the $32,000 for you. 
and she wanted to invest to earn an income of $2,000 per annum. Have you seen those references in this document, Mr Werrett? I have, yes. And if you look at 0462, we'll put them up for the benefit of others. We see there her $32,000 term deposit. And you've seen the references in the document to her goal being to invest to earn an income of $2,000 per annum. That's right. And on the 27th of April 2015, uh, Mr Harris gave this client a statement of advice. Yes, that is correct. And we see that at Exhibit 122 to your statement, which is ANZ 800 366 0427. Could I ask you to turn to 0441? And we see there that Mr Harris recommended that this client invest her term deposit proceeds in an asset choice investment wrap. Yes, that's correct. And for the advice he charged $1,650. <coughs> yes. The account had an upfront transaction fee of $161. Do you see that towards the top of the page, Mr Werrett? Transaction fees, yes, I do, yes. And there were ongoing fees of $1,152.88 per annum. Do you see that at the bottom of the page? Yep, so it's a combination of, of that and the, the platform fee and the advice fee, yes. Yes. So Mr Harris told the client that she could draw an income stream of $2,000 per annum but there was no analysis I want to put to you in this statement of advice of how that could be done. Uh, yes, that's right. The cash flow analysis was not done. <coughs> and on the first... The cash flow analysis was not done. <coughs> and on the 1st of May 2015, this elderly widow gave Mr Harris authority to proceed with this transaction? That's true. Uh, and do you think the advice that Mr Harris gave to this client was appropriate? No, I don't. Why not? My experience in and around the industry um, and having reviewed this file plus a number of others, um, somebody with a $30,000 lump sum to invest generally uh, at that age um, should not be put in a wrap account for one, incurring those costs. Second of all, I believe the right advice for the client at this stage was to not actually give the advice and certainly not incur that upfront fee. So you say in your statement that these were high upfront and ongoing costs associated with this investment wrap account with no distinguishable benefits for That's the right. client. Yes. Thank you. Now the second client you deal with in your statement Mr Harris met with on the 26th of May 2015? Uh, yes. And during this meeting, Mr Harris told that client that she could save three to four hundred dollars per year by rolling her super into a new account. Uh, that's correct. That's full notes, yes. And on the 11th of June 2015, Mr Harris gave this client a statement of advice. Yes. Which you've annexed to your statement at Exhibit 115, ANZ 800 And we see at 4828 that Mr Harris told this client that rolling over the super could save the client around $238 a year. Do you see that towards the bottom of the page? Yes, I can. And at 4843, we see that Mr Harris charged the client
$3,300 for this advice. Do you see that figure under the total next to SOA preparation, administration and research fee? Yes, I can. What, what are the figures beneath that figure, uh, Mr. Werrett? So there was another $3,790. So that uh, is referencing an, an ongoing ASF or advice service fee right. of 0.95%. And on the math with the opening account balance, that's the information uh, in regards to the cost there at $3,790. So for the advice that she could roll her super over uh, and save $238 a year, this client paid a $3,300 upfront fee and signed up to $3,790 as an annual ongoing service fee. That's correct. This client gave Mr Harris authority to proceed with this advice? Yes, I did. Do you think the advice that Mr Harris gave to his client was appropriate? No, I don't. You say in your statement, Mr Harris, that this advice with the fees charged meant that it would take the client 14 years to break even after her funds were rolled over into her new superannuation product. That's right. Thank you. Um, on the 8th of May 2015, a different customer made a complaint about Mr Harris. That's right? Uh, that is correct. Um, and this client felt that the advice that she'd received from Mr Harris didn't address her needs. Yes. Uh, and she questioned the fee that she'd been charged, which was $2,700. That's correct. And she wanted to stop the transfer of those funds because she didn't think the advice that she'd got was appropriate for what she'd gone to see the advisor about. Yes. And in June 2015, after receiving this complaint, Mr Harris's state development manager met with Mr Harris, is that right? That is right, yes. That was part of a standard practice management meeting? Yes. And can I ask you to look at the email chain that you've annexed to your statement, which is at Exhibit 41, uh, ANZ 800 382 -0918. We see at 918 there uh, that the customer um, wishes, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. We see at 918 there in the email from Ms Nolan at the bottom of the page, Ms Nolan from Millennium 3, um, that she wishes to put on the record uh, the nature of the meeting and some concerning statements made by Chris. Do you see she says over the page at 0919? It was very clear to me that Chris had little to no understanding of his opt-in obligations. Yes. The opt-in obligations. That's what the note is calling out, yes. Yes. And also on this page, I explained to Chris that he has an obligation to ensure his practice can adhere to the obligations and a personal obligation of self-management regarding the newest obligation. I explained to Chris the consequences if he is in breach, including ASIC investigation. Chris responded with, well, the ASIC investigation will happen then. You see that? I do. And she goes on to say, two paragraphs down, this is not the first time I have raised my concerns regarding Chris. The most recent past notification was made on the 15th of March 2015 by the PSA. What's the PSA, Mr Werrett? That's a, uh, a practice risk assessment for um, the state development managers or the practice development managers to um, to indicate the risk that they believe is in the business. And Ms Nolan concludes by saying, I believe Chris Harris poses too much risk to M3 
and nor should be associated with our licence moving forward. Do you see that? I do. So these are the views expressed by the State Development Manager at Millennium 3 uh, in June 2015. In your experience, how common is it for a State Development Manager to raise such strong concerns about the conduct of an advisor? In reading the language, it's very strong language. It is unusual in my experience. And this email was forwarded to the CEO, wasn't it? Uh, it went to the CEO via Mark Stubbings, yes. Yes, so it went to Mr Clippen, the CEO, and Daryl Foster on the 19th of June, uh, a few days later. Mr Clippen, we know, was the CEO, and Mr Foster was the Chief Operations Officer of Millennium 3. That's right. Uh, did Mr Clippen or Mr Foster respond to this email? in terms of actions or in writing. Um, certainly, the uh, Mr uh, Clippen did go back to Lauren um, asking for some clarity around certain points. Mm -hmm. All right, so in the time between Ms Nolan writing this email and it being forwarded on to the CEO and the Chief Operations Officer, um, there was a further audit of Mr Harris's files on the 17th of June, is that right? Uh, yes, that is correct. And it was on the 24th of June that Mr Harris had a letter with the outcome of that <laughs> audit. And that's Exhibit uh, 42 to your statement. Thank you. Um, ANZ 800 Yes. Um, and we see there that Mr Harris in that audit received an advice quality rating of four. That's correct. That's the second lowest rating. It is. Uh, and following this audit, he was again required to submit all advice for vetting. That's correct. Then a few weeks after this audit, on the 17th of July 2015, Ms Nolan sent another email to the CEO, Mr Clippen and you've annexed that at Exhibit 45 to your statement, ANZ 800 3660173. And we see, wait for that to come up. Try again at ANZ 800 386 0176. <coughs> Thank you. Sorry. Um, and I want to take you to the second page. Uh, perhaps we could have um, 0177. We're looking for 0177. <coughs> Thank you very much, 0177. And we see this is another email. Well, you can't see, I'm sorry. Um, hopefully you can see from the version you have there that this is another email from Ms Nolan. Uh, you can see it at the bottom. Her name has been redacted from the top, but you can see from the bottom that this is another email from Ms Nolan. What you can't see here is that it's also an email to Mr Clippen, the CEO. I can see that on my copies, yes. Thank you. Uh, so we see here that in this email, Ms Nolan is 
saying I refer you back to the PSA that was submitted in March of this current year and the corresponding notes, I did not receive a formal response on either. And she goes on to say, in summary, I believe Chris is a high risk to the organisation should cease his authority with M3. Do you see that towards the bottom? I can. And if we turn to 0176, which is on the opposite side of the <coughs> screen, we see Mr Clippen's response to Ms Nolan's email. We see that he preferred to manage, supervise, risk control and ensure the business is in solid shape. Do you see that reference? Yes. Yes, I do. At number three? Yes. And could I ask you to look at another document which is not annexed to your statement? ANZ 800-450-0003. And on the, we see that on the 23rd of July, that's three days after Mr Clippen's response that I just took you to, Ms. Do Ms Nolan responds to Mr Clippen's email and she says that it would be appropriate to put Mr Harris on a two to three month performance plan but also notes that he's not completed earlier remediation requirements in a satisfactory manner. Do you see it's, that's on 0004, I apologise, you've had the wrong page on the screen. Number three, down the bottom. This is in response to Richard's reply. This is in response to the CEO's preference for how to handle this matter. Thank you. Yes. I... And then back to the page we were on before, triple zero three. We see a response from Mr. Hare, who was the risk and compliance advisor. Yeah, from Ms Hare, yeah, Dale. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry, Ms Hare. Yes. Uh, and Ms Hare says in the final paragraph there, over a number of years, Millennium 3 has provided training and coaching to Chris where there is improvement for a short time and then he slips back into old habits. Believe we need to terminate once issues are remediated. Yes. I tender that document, Commissioner. Email Nolan to Clippen and others of... Uh, 9 August 2015, ANZ 800 450 0 003 will be Exhibit 2.144. Uh, this email is dated the 9th of August and the following day on the 10th of August 2015, Ms Nolan and Mr Clippen met with Ms Harris. You tell us that in your statement. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, did I say Ms Harris? Mr Harris, I'm sorry. And as a result of that meeting, it was decided that Millennium 3 needed to send Mr Harris a letter of censure. That's right. Um, in what kinds of circumstances do ANZ and Millennium 3 send letters of censure to advisers? Uh, when you are uh, giving them clear instructions as to what behaviour is being called out, what behaviour is expected and the consequences of that behaviour. It's generally a quite a severe um, outcome in terms of a consequence. Do you think that was an appropriate outcome given the concerns that had been raised by the State Development Manager? No, I don't. Thank you. And the letter of censure wasn't sent for some time. It wasn't sent until the end of September 2015. That's correct. And you've given us that letter of censure, which is Exhibit 51 to your statement, uh, ANZ 800 3700 Sorry, I'll just... Tara Foster, yes. And... ANZ 800 370 So 
this letter refers to the meeting between Ms Nolan, Mr Clippen and Mr Harris on the 10th of August 2015. That's correct. And it says that by mutual agreement, Mr Harris will ensure all relevant client files are sent to pre-vet for review prior to issuing to clients and uphold his professional obligations, advice quality standard, compliance and legislative requirements. That's correct. And I had taken you to documents earlier today, <coughs> right, Mr Wherat, that showed that by August 2015, ANZ knew that pre-vetting was not an effective control mechanism. That's correct. Uh, and other than pre-vetting and a requirement that he attend a training course, there were no consequences imposed on Mr Harris, were there? Uh, considerations for, again, power planning, but um, back to yours, no, that is correct. Um, did Mr Harris comply with the requirement to submit his files for pre-vetting? I don't believe in all instances, no. Thank you. And then on the 26th of February the following year, 2016, um, Ms Helen Ruano, uh, a Millennium 3 practice development coach, went to visit Mr Harris's practice to provide training to two of his employees, is that right? right. And during that training she identified that some of Mr Harris's customers it didn't look like they were receiving ongoing services that they'd been paying fees for. Yes, that is correct. And Millennium 3 <coughs> decided to investigate that? Uh, yes. And in order to investigate whether an advisor's failed to provide ongoing services, you need to see what the advisor's promised to provide the client, don't you? Uh, yes, the, the process is they're looking at the uh, advisor agreements um, and whether there was a promise to deliver a service or an offer to receive a service. But the starting point for any assessment has to be those agreements. Yep. Uh, so you have to see the agreements and then you have to see the records of the services provided? Uh, certainly evidence, yes. And to see both of those things you need to review the client files? Yes. And was Millennium 3 able to access Mr Harris's client files to conduct that investigation? Uh, as the statement indicates, over a period of time uh, attempts were made um, to access that information, uh, get it either into uh, X-Plan or physically have cite the files. But again, I acknowledge that uh, far too long in terms of a timeline happened. It took over a year, didn't it, it to access Mr Harris's client files? Uh, to conduct that assessment from when it was first called out as possibly an issue, yes. Well, it wasn't until March 2017 that anyone was able to collect those files from Mr Harris's practice. That's right. Um, are you aware that ASIC has warned the industry several years ago about the obligation to have access at all times to client records? Uh, yes, I'm aware of that. Um, can I take you to ASIC report 251, which is RCD 0003 0057 0001? Are you familiar with ASIC report 251, Mr Werrett? Uh, I understand. I have... Um I am aware of our requirements from an AFSL aspect in terms of having access to client files. I haven't read the report cover to cover. So this is a report from ASIC yep. um, reviewing financial advice industry practice. Um, and if I could ask you to look at, before we turn to it, you'll see it's dated September 2011. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you to look at 0022? You see there the reminder from ASIC on licensees of their obligation to have access at all times to client records so that they can respond to client complaints or disputes and can review advisor conduct whenever they need to do so. We are concerned that many licensees do not retain copies of client records but leave record retention to the discretion of their advisors. Contractual obligations between the advisor and licensee are often relied upon to ensure that a licensee could access client information. However, if an advisor leaves the licensee and does not cooperate in providing client information, it can be difficult for licensees to respond to future inquiries or complaints about advice provided. 
Most licensees are moving towards storing their records electronically, which is a positive step forward in terms of fulfilling their record retention obligation. Um, this obligation was not complied with in respect of Mr Harris's files. So certainly the length of time that it took to get the, the files and information from Mr uh, Harris, the, the responsibility of the licence, the files were there, um, but they were stored again, um, going back to the report, in Mr Harris's office. Um, so I would acknowledge that it took far too long for us to get our hands on those client files. And that is, I want to suggest to you, in breach of the obligation referred to here to have access at all times to client records. So I believe what the file shows me is going back is that the files were at Mr Harris's office, but certainly the extent and the process that we went through to gain access to that uh, clearly I don't believe was strong enough. Yes, and you didn't have access to them, did you? Because it took a year to extract them from Mr Harris's office. It, it took a long time to get them out, yes. It took over a year, didn't right. it? Thank you. I uh, tender this document, Commissioner. Exhibit 2.145, uh, ASIC Report 251, uh, RCD 0003, 0057, uh, 0057 rather, treble 01. And can I ask you also to look at ASIC report 362, which was a subsequent report to this report, um, Mr Werrett, which is RCD 0003, 0045, 001. This is phase two of that report, July 2013. Are you familiar with this document? Uh, again, I understand the content, but I haven't read it cover to cover. Okay, could I ask you just to look briefly at 0010? <coughs> and we'll bring up. Do we need the next page as well? Just read the version. Yeah, I, we, we'll, uh, I'll just direct your attention to recommendation eight for licensees and advisors in this table. Yes. Which again emphasises that rather than relying solely on contractual agreements, licensees should retain access to client records in a more proactive way, such as by using electronic storage platforms. This will allow the licensee to respond to regulators, auditors, clients and product issuers whenever they need to do so in a timely and efficient manner. Do you accept that you were not retaining access to Mr Harris's client records in accordance with this recommendation? I accept the, the recommendation says that licences should be moving towards electronic storage of that information. Uh, we have embarked on a substantial program of work to move all of our licences onto XPlan. We have, out of 400 businesses, now less than 10 businesses that are not on X-Plan, and we have plans for those. Uh, that is the first step for us to enable the advisors to store that information electronically into X-Plan. Is it compulsory for authorised representatives to use X-Plan? Uh, it is now, yes. The only businesses, as I mentioned, we have less than 10 out of 400. Our view, our considered view over the last 18 months was we want all of our businesses on X-Plan. Those that fundamentally stated that they wouldn't move to X-Plan, uh, we've parted companies with in terms of licensee support. Uh, and by 30 June this year, we'll only have X-Plan as our documentation storage system um, for, sorry, for the production of advice. So, it won't be until 30 June this year where it will be mandated completely. I see, I see. So it's not currently compulsory for authorised representatives to use X Plan. Uh, so that, it, as I said, out of the 400 businesses, all but less than 10 must and are using X Plan. Currently? Currently. Well, I just want to understand that in light of a document I'm going to show you, Mr Werrett, which is ANZ 800-165-1331.
which is a document I think authored by you. Before we go to that, um, Commissioner, could I tender the ASIC report that we've just looked at? ASIC report 362 RCD 003 0045 0001 will be exhibit 2.146. This is a document presented by you as the General Manager of Aligned Licensees and Advice Standards for a meeting on the 12th of December last year. That's right. And could we turn to 1338 in this document? <coughs> and do you see there under the heading Project Beer, second paragraph, However, advisers in the aligned dealer group businesses, in particular FSP and M3, do not have to use XPlan, financial planning software. Uh, that is a historical context um, well, that that is, is being written in. This is December last year. No, but you'll notice on the right hand side, the, the project beer is a building efficiency, eliminating risk. What that is about is we recognised that not having all our businesses on X plan, particularly in those two groups that are mentioned there, we started off with about 78-ish uh, businesses not on X plan mm -hmm. out of those 400. Uh, you can see here as a, as a progress report, we've moved that down to um, 31 businesses um, and then a subsequent report um, down to 15. And as I said, the latest numbers is 10. So I recognise that the old model um, in FSP and M3. Uh, RI, we have mandated X-Plan. Every single business is already on X-Plan. Uh, the old model allowed them to pick whichever software they want. Today's model, um, it's X-Plan. I see. I tender this document, Commissioner. Uh, what shall I describe it as, Ms Orr? It is... Uh... I have CPS 510 remuneration compliance, which seemed an odd title given the subject matter, but uh, seems to be the title of it. ANZ 800 165 1311, uh, Exhibit 2.147, and the date of the document is or December 17? 12 December 2017, Commissioner. Thank you. Now, I, I just want to ask you some questions about what was going on in that one year when you were trying to extract Mr Harris's files from his practice, Mr Werrett. Um, at the beginning of that period, in May 2016, Mr Harris had already been on Millennium 3's watch list for two or three years. Is that right? That is correct. He'd had at least two audits where he'd received a four or a five, the lowest ratings. Correct. And his state development manager, Ms Nolan, had raised serious concerns <laughs> about his attitude towards compliance and his understanding of his legal obligations. Correct. But during that whole time when you were trying to extract these files from Mr Harris's practice, Mr Harris was permitted to continue providing advice to clients. That's correct. Millennium 3 didn't suspend him? Uh, not at that period, no. Didn't terminate his authority? No. I want to put to you that what happened in that period was a lot of meetings at which Mr Harris's conduct was discussed. I would absolutely accept that there was a lot of meetings during that period of time and a lot of discussions. And was there any action taken in relation to Mr Harris in that period? Uh, other than the vetting and the suggestion of power planning and, and the other things in terms of um, the documentation, the file around Lawrence visits, certainly not the appropriate action, certainly in my eyes, wasn't taken. In December 2016, all the meetings eventually resulted in a decision to send a second censure letter, didn't it? Uh, it did. Yes. And that letter of censure was going to be in almost the same terms as the earlier censure letter? That is my understanding, yes. Was that letter ever actually sent? Uh, no. The letter of censure was not sent. Yes. And that was because Mr Harris was told in January 2017 that there was going to be a targeted review. Is that right? Uh, yes, we, there was going to be a targeted review of his business. Um, my understanding is, in um, um, doing some investigations to prepare this statement, my understanding is that the uh, letter of censure was, uh, it was an oversight in terms of it not being sent. Yes. 
but there were multiple internal forums and bodies all talking about Mr Harris during this one year period when he was continuing to provide advice. Yes, I will acknowledge that. Yes. And then when the decision was made to conduct the targeted review, uh, in January 2017, Mr Harris was told which of his files would be reviewed. Uh, in, for the targeted review? Yes. Yes, they were selected, yes. Isn't it against your audit policy to tell an advisor which of their files are going to be reviewed? Uh, for my understanding, for the target review process, we called for um, a number of files. I see. And then in March 2017, Ms Nolan and Ms Ruano visit Mr Harris's practice. That's correct. And there's some email correspondence after that in which Ms Nolan expresses her continued serious concerns about Chris's capacity, <coughs> both in an advice role and as a business owner of a financial planning practice. Uh, and Ms Nolan says that due to the severity of issues that have been raised, uh, she forwards again her recommendations for immediate suspension with a view to terminating his authority. That's correct. And in response to that email communication, which you've annexed to your statement, the result was scheduling a meeting to discuss what should be done. That's correct. Mm -hmm. uh, and in around April of 2017, you say that you had a telephone conversation with Ms Blackford, who was Millennium 3's national manager. Uh, yes, prior to that, the uh, targeted review draft, I believe, um, uh, come across my desk. I made a phone call to Ms Blackford at the time, uh, inquiring as to why, based upon the information that I could see end to end in the report, uh, we were having, well, there was another meeting. I didn't think that was appropriate and I communicated that. Yes, you tell us in your statement that you said to Ms Blackford words to the effect of, why are we having a meeting, just terminate. That's right. And this was a good question, wasn't it, Mr Whereat? Why was there a need for yet another meeting to discuss Mr Harris? I have no idea. What was Ms Blackford's response to that? Uh, so uh, she agreed. Um, there, I believe the meeting was, con was already scheduled um, and then um, the decision is recorded in my statement as to the outcome of that meeting. Yes, but so the meeting went ahead? Yes. And a couple of days before that meeting, the draft report of the targeted review was provided? That's right. And this was a targeted review that had been requested six months earlier, on the 4th of November 2016? That's right. Uh, now, that uh, targeted review report is annexed to your statement at Exhibit 86, ANZ 800 3826765. Uh, and at 0766- Mr Werrett? Yes. We see the list of issues that were identified as a result of that targeted review. That's correct. Which included non-delivery of ongoing service, non-issuance of fee disclosure statements, late issuance of fee disclosure statements, under-disclosed ongoing service fees, inappropriate advice and advice outside authorisation. That's correct. And then... At the meeting on the 6th of April 2017, a decision was made to terminate Mr Harris's status as an authorised representative. That's correct. Do you think it's acceptable that it took so long for Millennium 3 to terminate Mr Harris's status as an authorised representative? Absolutely not. And why wasn't the decision made sooner, Mr Werrett? I, I, I don't know. I've been looking at the file from end to end and I can't find a reason as to why swifter action wasn't taken. Would you agree that a key aspect of ensuring that appropriate advice is provided to customers is ensuring that there are consequences for advisers who fail to comply with their obligations? I do. And to be effective, those consequences have to apply soon after the advisor's conduct? Uh, 
my view is, is consequences need to change behaviour, yes. Mm -hmm. And it was in June 2017 that Millennium 3 sent a letter to ASIC about Mr Harris's conduct? Uh, that's correct. And was that letter a notification of a significant breach under Section 912D of the Corporations Act? That, that's, no, I don't, I don't believe it was. I believe. And why not? Uh, I don't know. I believe um, at that time, post the uh, the review, um, we've issued to let ASIC know um, of our concerns with Mr Harris's files. Um, upon reflection and looking at it all, a, a, a breach notice could have been sent. Okay. And do you know if Mr Harris was a member of a professional association? I don't personally know. No, and you don't know whether any report was made about his conduct to a professional association? Uh, I, I don't know, but I can find no evidence of that in the file. And it was in June last year that moves were made to discuss potential remediation of Mr Harris's clients, is that right? That is correct. Uh, and the Remediation Governance Forum gave endorsement to referring Mr Harris's clients for remediation in July 2017? That is correct. And by the end of October 2017, these matters had been referred to the advice review team, but they still hadn't been scoped or formalised? That's right. We talked earlier about two clients of Mr Harris who were given inappropriate advice in May and June 2015. Have either of those clients been remediated for that inappropriate advice? In, in preparing for this statement um, and having a look at it, I acknowledged up front that I have asked for one of those files to be prioritised and have escalated that. As of today, uh, the financial remediation hasn't been completed for both clients. Well, have either of them been remediated? for the inappropriate advice? No. No. Um, have any of Mr Harris's clients been remediated for inappropriate advice that he gave or for fees that he charged without providing services? No. Why not? Uh, again, we would like to move um, faster relative to um, some of the other issues that we have in the advice remediation team. Uh, we are working on events with a higher priority. I think everything's important. We'd like to go quick. It's very competitive market in terms of finding these specialised resources to, to actually respond and recreate the files such that we can do the detriment calculations. It's not good enough that we're not going fast enough, um, but certainly we're, we, are, we are improving the way that we are doing it. But I think Mr Harris has a set of circumstances where it's taken us far too long. We well, it's nearly absolutely apologise for that. It's nearly three years since the two clients that I used as examples received their inappropriate advice, isn't it, Mr Warrett? It is. And it's not good enough. Yes. I have one final topic to deal with, Commissioner. I'm very sorry that we've gone so far over, but I have um, just a few final questions on one last topic, which is whether or not you know whether Mr Harris is still working as a financial advisor, Mr Warrett. I am aware that he is. I'm still operating as a financial advisor. Do you know which licensee he currently provides financial services on behalf of? Uh, I do. And who, which financial, um, which licensee is that? Uh, Dover. And did Dover contact Millennium 3 for a reference in relation to Mr Harris in May 2017? Uh, they did. Uh, could I ask that you be shown DOV 0001 0001 1606? So this is a letter from uh, Dover Financial Advisors to Millennium 3 on the 24th of May last year. Yes. And can you see here that Dover is asking Millennium 3 if they're aware of any circumstance or action that may affect Mr Harris's ability to provide financial advice honestly and fairly. They're asking whether Millennium 3 is aware of any client complaints and whether uh, 
Mr Harris has been subject to any action, investigation, inquiry or audit concerning character, competence or conduct. Yes. You see that? I can. I tender that letter, Commissioner. Exhibit 2.148, letter Dover Financial Advisors to Millennium 3 Financial Services, 24 May 07, DOV 0001-0001-1606, Exhibit 2.148. Can I take you to the response to this letter, uh, Mr Werrett, which is DOV 0001-0001-1608? Now, you see this information provided by Ms Blackford uh, to Dover in relation to Mr Harris. Ms Blackford tells Dover that ANZ has identified that Mr Harris has various ongoing services agreements in place for which he charges clients an ongoing advisor service fee. Those agreements require Mr Harris to offer or provide periodic reviews to clients and ANZ has identified a number of instances in which Mr Harris has charged clients an additional record of advice fee for the advice provided to them at periodic reviews to which an ongoing services agreement relates. That's right. And there's a reference to four client complaints which have resulted in payment of compensation and two unresolved complaints. And a review down the bottom of a sample of Mr Harris's client files during which various issues have been detected. That's correct. Do you think this disclosure was adequate, Mr Whereat? I think it could have been more forthcoming. Well, we know, don't we, that by this time Mr Harris had had three audits with the lowest possible ratings. There'd been a targeted review of 28 client files <coughs> which found that there was potential client detriment in relation to 25 of those files. And only a couple of weeks prior to sending this letter, um, Millennium 3 had made a notification to ASIC in relation to Mr Harris. I acknowledge all that. But none of those matters were mentioned in this letter? Um, no, they're not. Why not? I'm unsure as to what the, uh, why they were omitted. I'm just thinking how I would react to receiving a reference like that um, in today, 2018, and whether that would be sufficient for us to accept. And I think there is enough information raised in there for serious questions to be asked. But why hold back the other information, Mr Werrett? I'm unsure. As this to isn't why. a long time ago. This letter um, was sent uh, in the middle of last year. Uh, yeah, I acknowledge it. Uh, and I, I just want to correct something I said. The notification to ASIC was a couple of weeks after, after. this letter. That's so right. you were, it seems, in the process of working out whether to notify ASIC at this time. Yep. Um, but I just want to understand whether you accept that in a situation like this where Millennium 3 had extensive concerns about Mr Harris, the community would expect Millennium 3 to communicate those concerns to the new licensee? I, I'd ex I would accept that. I think this is an indication um, where the ABA protocol um, that is a great step forward for the industry. I'd like to see everybody being a participant in the ABA protocol for that exact purpose. I will acknowledge that there was more information that should have been put in here. It's something I need to look at in terms of our uh, references that we're giving to people that operate outside of the ABA uh, protocol. Uh, and that's something that I will be doing. You are a subscriber to the protocol we at are. ANZ. Millennium 3 is a subscriber. Yes. But nonetheless, you provided inadequate information to Dover in response to their inquiries about Mr Harris. That's right. Thank you. I have no further questions, Commissioner. You want to tender that reply. I'm sorry, I do wish to tender that. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. The letter from Millennium 3 to Dover in reply to Exhibit 2.148, 2 DOV 0001-0001-1608 becomes Exhibit 2.149. Now, does any party other than ANZ seek leave to cross-examine this witness? And dare I ask, Ms Williams, how long you will be? Uh, 
I would only be a couple of minutes in my estimation, Commissioner. Let's there is get just one Ireland matter. Do it then, Ms. Williams. I'm obliged to the Commission. Uh, Mr. Warrick, could you turn please to paragraph 4.63 of your statement at page 20? <coughs> oh, it's up on screen, sorry. Yes. Ah, yes, you do have it on the screen there. Yep. Uh, Mr. Warrick, uh, I just wanted to ask you about your reference in uh, paragraphs B and C there to uh, the client's risk uh, profile and the rate of return on a portfolio reflecting the client's risk profile. Uh, how, if at all, does that rate of return differ from the time cost of money? Well, it doesn't. It's... You're asking me the calculation? Uh, I'm asking... Uh, if you could explain uh, for the Commission uh, the manner in which a rate of return on a portfolio reflecting the client's risk profile is arrived at. Yep. So part C is we're looking for a, a, a similar portfolio or a um, relevant portfolio as a benchmark um, to calculate the interest that would otherwise have been earned on that investable let, sum. Let me just see if I understand it. So for every $100 that's been invested in a uh, an ill-advised product, yes. uh, you take that $100 and apply to it the return that would have been achieved had it been invested in the kind of risk profile that the client wanted. That's exactly right. It's, so it's more than time value of money, it's return. Yes. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry, Commissioner, just one further question, if I may. Uh, Mr Weirat, you referred to the uh, remediation framework uh, in answer to one of the Commissioner's questions earlier. Uh, has that framework been uh, approved or agreed to by ASIC, to the best of your knowledge? Uh, it, it has. Yes, uh, yes we're in ongoing discussions with, with um, ASIC in terms of the framework. Um, we've got an external assurance um, company, the professional services firm that we're working with. Uh, ASIC has uh, uh, been actively involved in the evolution of the of the program um, so yes they are aware of the framework um, and the way that we calculate monies thank you mr Weir. Uh, commissioner there's nothing further might mr Weir be excused thank you there's nothing arising Ms. all thank you very much mr Weir. i'm sorry we've uh, put you under route march conditions to finish today but i suspect you'll uh, thank us for that on monday morning not having to return uh, you may step down and you're excused further attendance. Um, 9.45 on Monday. Yes, Ms. thank you. And I'm grateful to the Commissioner for sitting on today. Thank you. 9.45 on Monday next.